Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending upon where you are in the world. Welcome to Apps Events uh, Virtual Google EDU Summit with a focus on math and science in the remote and hybrid classroom. We have a really exciting eight jam-packed sessions for you today. And uh, my name is Lisa Thuman, and I'm talking to you from New Jersey. I'm a high school technology facilitator and also the US Director for Apps Events in the United States. Um, so we have just an amazing lineup of speakers uh, and we're going to have some great speakers in the panel with us um, to kick off the day. I want to thank Acer for sponsoring Apps Events and specifically for sponsoring um, our virtual summit today. You can actually fill out this form and I will drop the link a couple of times. Um, in the chat for you all, but it's gsummit.link slash Acer. Uh, we're going to use that link today to win uh, a free seat in one of our boot camps coming up in January, but also uh, we're going to be giving away some explain everything codes and some uh, newly hot minted off the press uh, books from our uh, speaker, Jesse Lubinsky. So go ahead and fill out that form and I will drop it in the chat soon. Um, I invite you to share what's happening during our time together using the hashtag Google PD and Apps Events. And Apps Events is on Twitter at Apps Events One. So our speakers with us today, uh, we've got Katie Fielding, Tammy Lind, Tara Linney, Jesse Lubinsky, Tom Mullaney, Rashawn Richards, Louis Shenefelt and myself, I'll be presenting today uh, in a few hours on Google Keep. Uh, I'm Lisa Thuman. So I invite you to drop some comments in the chat to share a success you have experienced during remote or hybrid learners. And what I'd like to do now is uh, I'm going to go ahead and add that to our stream and I'm going to invite our speakers. Here's Katie, here's Tammy, and here's Jesse, and we're going to have a conversation and let's all talk about what successes we've experienced during hybrid and remote learning thus far. So who would like to kick it off? Go I'll ahead, go. Jesse. <laughs> oh, no, I was oh. actually holding out my hands to pass it to him. I, <laughs> I, I would just start off by saying, you know, I want to um, give a shout out to all the educators out there who've shown such resiliency. Oh, I, don't, I take back what I just said. I don't. <laughs> um, I, just, I, I don't think any teacher expected to have to make the types of adjustments and pivots that they have during this pandemic. And I think um, one success, and this is more of a general success, uh, has really been how teachers have stretched themselves uh, beyond what I think they even thought they were capable of for themselves uh, during this pandemic. So I think where I'm hoping we come out of this on the other side is uh, with teachers realizing that they're capable of doing some really incredible things in the classroom and that maybe they aren't as hesitant as they might have been to push themselves a little bit further in terms of what they can do. Uh, if we're talking about a very specific, uh, tangible, type of success. I think one thing I would look to is how teachers have uh, tried to pivot their instruction to make it more inquiry based and less of a direct, you know, me sage on the stage talking to my students as opposed to including them as part of the process. And I know that one way that's been done uh, through the use of tools like, uh, you know, G Suite has been through making that pivot to like almost like a hyperdocs type model where rather than me designing my instruction uh, my lesson plan kind of for me as a script, I'm really designing that unit so that students can participate and I can actually create those branch off type of activities for students who need more remediation or for students who are ahead. But ultimately, they know where we started, they know where we're going, and we can all take our own path to get there. Well stated, well stated. I, um, I, you know, I like to take over the conversation, but the one silver lining that I've seen since March 16th, right? That one silver lining is those teachers that hadn't embraced the use of technology in their classrooms. Now, you know, at first were kind of forced at hand to use it and now have a much higher comfort level with it and see the uses. And, and I'm hoping that that translates for them 
when we come back, either hybrid or fully, fully in person. Um, it's been a pleasure uh, in the high school that I'm working in to see those teachers really seeing, you know, this is an effective tool for, I, I wish I had been using this all along. Um, I'll stop talking. <laughs> Who's next? <laughs> Katie, go ahead. Okay, sure. I am a tech coach at a school of almost 3,000, a high school of almost 3,000 kids. And before the pandemic, we were not nearly one-to-one. -one. So it was quite a shift for my teachers to go from like not um, not always having the access to technology um, to everyone now having it and having to use it completely. And um, our quarter just ended um, yesterday and I gave a survey to my staff um, and most of them were at fours and fives with feeling comfortable about using video conferencing and our online classroom. So the fact that they're all feeling much more comfortable and we know we're gonna be doing that through the next quarter as well, like that makes me excited about what they're gonna be more um, apt to branch out into and trying those um, those things that they haven't yet done. Yeah, yeah. so just their comfort is good to me. Definitely. Very similar to to what you guys have already said. I just the first word, when, Lisa, when you asked that question, is resilience popped into my head. That that's the the one thing that I keep coming back to. And I think what I'm most proud of, as far as the success, is just the the educators that I work with. The laser focus on what's best for our community and for our kids. You know, they're mm -hmm. they're constantly coming and saying, "What next? What else can I do? What else? What else? What else?" You know, and like we've. And, you know, to March, we started March 13th, um, March 13th, we just had, you know, sponges just ready to go. And they have just pivoted as they've needed to. And it's just, I'm so proud, you know, of the educators that I work with and educators in general. Um, just that laser focus on making sure what we're doing, while not in the best of situations, we're making the best and, and we're thriving in the situation with our kids. So I would echo everything that you guys said. Thank you, Tammy, Katie, and Jesse. So Dee in the chat is saying, you know, one of the successes has been sharing their learning with their students. And I see a lot of that going on. You know, uh, the, the educator in the room might be stumbling over the technology and the kids step up and, oh, I can screen share with you and show you how to do this or send them a private message and, you know, whatever messaging system they might be using. But it's been really great for the educator to take a role as a learner. Yeah, that hand in hand learning is that kind of got, you know, jumped to the front, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. What um oh sorry. Oh no, go ahead, Jesse. I think we've seen both, right? I think we've seen students uh stepping up and leading the way. I also think we've seen some frustration on the educators' parts in terms of making this assumption that my students know how to do certain things with technology. And yet they don't, because I think we make this presumption that, wow, because they know how to TikTok, that must mean they know how to convert a document to a PDF and submit it through Google Classroom. Right. And that's not the case. So I think the same um, patience and generosity and uh, and kind of kindness we're, we're hoping to receive as educators, we want to make sure that we're giving that same grace to students as well, because I think it's a struggle that everyone from admins to teachers to students, uh, um, you know, it, we're all experiencing it. And I think there's a, another group, the parents, that we've wow. had to interact with and help more than ever because it's just as frustrating for them as it is for, for the teachers and the students. I, that's a great segue. Like, I, I love that you said that, Katie, because um, I think every district has done it slightly differently, what they have provided the community, um, what uh, whether it be training or videos or whatever. And do, do any of you want to share um, what what you've done to support parents and guardians? Yeah, I can share for my district. We've had several um, district level parent um, events uh, in online video conferencing. My school has held school level events. And then my like office hours, my Calendly, any teacher or parent or student can use it. So I'm available to, to anyone who wants to make an appointment with me for help. So that's just at my school how we're doing things. I mean, it's worked really well. Um, so, you know, I can be working with a teacher one minute and then the next meeting I'm with a parent and then with a student. So we're, I think it's all hands on deck for, for helping everyone. 
similar to Katie, we're working with schools right now to design um, supports for not just educators, which is what we traditionally do, but for parents and for students to kind of support them in the how to do, uh, for the parent's perspective, how do I support my child uh, through this process? And for, um, for students, you know, how do we help streamline and navigate the work they have to do during the day? Because every diff every teacher has their own set of, uh, the, you know, their own playbook and how they kind of want to run things. And I think when you try to pigeonhole teachers into everyone has to do it the same way, that's not going to work. So it's really, how do we make this as easy as possible for students? How do we support them? So, you know, even creating simple screencasts and making those available for parents and students on specific tasks or skills, that's one way to support um, them trying to navigate this process. Yeah, that's kind of been my entry point is through the teachers. So if a, a community member or parent is having a problem, they might put us in contact. And then like Jesse said, I might make a screencast or hop on a call or that's been kind of fun to hop on, you know, video calls with parents. And I think that's been kind of fun, you know, just, you know, you don't touch base with, with community and parents in that way when we're in person. And that's been a lot of fun to get to know them in that way. And they really appreciate it. Like they yeah. see the value and, and, they, and they appreciate that schools are take, are recognizing them as valued stakeholders and that they need the supports as well. For sure. And, and John from the chat saying that parents are often out of the loop with how to use classroom and share documents. And I know at my in my district, we provided a parent academy. Um, some of it was live. And of course, everything was archived so they can view the Google Meets that we did at any time. Um, I meet with students virtually before school each day and at the end of school, um, you know, after last period to do things like, you know, you having trouble with your device let's make sure the operating system is up to date and you know especially like our life schools our life skills students um, a lot of those things they can't do independently um, but it has been wonderful I agree like once we got past parent teacher conferences doing that not parent teacher conferences back to school doing it virtually the parents are like I can do this like I want to I want to meet with this teacher I want to get help I you know I'm I'm not getting my guardian summaries in Google Classroom I need to get this fixed and and I think it's just been really great to to embrace everybody as, as a community. I think in my community, it's um, put down some barriers that parents previously had to accessing things like back to school night, if you know they worked in the evening or um, you know other, you know, the time element is removed for many parents and that's right. been really helpful. Yeah, I've gotten a lot of calls from work or video calls from work or, you know, definitely. I, I think too, it's the, just the access has increased. You know, we may not, in a, in a traditional environment be as accessible to them um, or they might be intimidated by ooh, a technology person. I don't know if I want to talk to them. Um, and it's just, it's really, like you guys said, it's really breaking down those, those walls and those barriers for the whole community, which has been really exciting. So um, let's pivot just a little bit. And, you know, I wanted to, to start off on just such a positive note, um, sticking with successes that we've experienced. Let's talk about potentially what this is going to look like when we are all back physically on our campuses mm -hmm. um, and still with, you know, our one to one devices and, when, you know, crossing our fingers at the bandwidth in the building, it's going to hold up, right? Yeah. When, what do you predict? What What's that classroom going to look like? That's a good question. <laughs> That's a very good question. Well, it's, yeah. Well, you from the chat is saying yeah. that communication has improved between teachers and students and parents. And, and, you know, there's been tons of digital communication since March 16th, but now those teachers are going to be able to speak with the students actually in the room. And if you're in hybrid, like my building goes hybrid Monday morning, November 9th, we're going hybrid. Um, we'll have a third of our students in the building. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Um, how do you think that communication is still going to be very much digital or that the students will stay after to talk with the teacher? 
I think it's going to be both. I think, you know, I think the Pandora's box is open and now parents can see the access that they can have. Um, And, you know, that many groups like disabled people have been asking for for years. It's now accessible um, all the time and from home. And so I think that that box isn't going to get closed and the access and communication is going to just keep going. I think one of the things that it excites me, you know, when we look at what we did in March and then when we we started remote in my school district. Um, and I think one thing that excites me for when we come back in person is the team, the team atmosphere across buildings. You know, we've really had to, you know, second grade isn't second grade in one building. We, you know, we have four elementaries. It, it's second grade. And I think that that has really become much more apparent to everyone that we really can band together everybody collectively across buildings because we've broken down that travel barrier between, you know, to get to meetings. And I, I think when we come face to face, I can't wait to see how we take advantage of still using the digital ways to meet, but then we also can add that face to face component that, you know, I'm really looking forward to seeing what comes from that. See, where, where my head goes first isn't necessarily communication, although I think Katie summed it up perfectly, which is Pandora's box has been opened. <laughs> we have open that back in. Now it's like there's the, going to be the problem moving forward that we've already started to see with teachers being available 24 hours a day and kind of having to just manage for that piece for themselves. Yeah. But I think the place where my head goes is in terms of how we design learning experiences for kids because – that's really where teachers have stretched themselves the most and where schools have really started to see a push forward in terms of the types of instruction that we're delivering to our students and how we kind of had to reinvent the model on the fly. So now when we go back, what we don't want to see is a shift back to that old way of delivering um, content to students. And so I think really the thing that I hope schools take out from take away from this is that you need people like like the three of you, like Lisa, Katie, and Tammy, were in school supporting the work of teachers and coaches, coaches to help make that work happen because it's not going to happen by itself. Teachers are going to go back and they're still going to need support moving forward in using these tools. Just because you have great tools doesn't mean you're going to have great instruction. You need great support to be able to make that move from leveraging those great tools to delivering great instruction. And I think with that improved and greater instruction, also uh, more progressive um, grading practices and policies in districts and things like that will also be pushed forward that have maybe been kind of like whole in a holding pattern for a while. Well, (laughs) right. right. Standardized tests didn't happen and the world didn't collapse. (laughs) I think it did, but not because we didn't have standardized tests. Right, right. But, you know. Yeah. I don't know. It, that, it's been, you know, a big issue um, in my district. It's a high-performing district, and, and um, you know, they were used to everything relies on assessment. So yeah. assessing in the high, well, assessing in the remote environment has been a big challenge and a big pivot for a lot of the, for all of the teachers that I work with. Yeah, no, it's been a huge pivot for mine as well, you know, um, a lot of people wanting that lockdown browser so they could use that type of assessment they've used for a long time and having to just shift their mindset on that and shifting it towards more authentic project-based things that their students are going to honestly enjoy doing more. <laughs> and that's been the, the best part of this whole thing is watching teachers break down those walls that they've had. Because honestly, if the pandemic never happens those shifts never get made. The opportunities are never there to break it down in the way that they had to out of necessity. I think too, one thing that kids are going to advocate for themselves. You know, I think, I think we're going to start to get kids that will say, you know, I, this paper pencil, I'm not sure I can show you everything I know here. So let me create this video because then I'll show you really what I know. And I think that's what we're going to hopefully what we're going to see is that kids will start to advocate for themselves in the best way that they can show us what they know. I a hundred percent agree. <laughs> well, I want to thank the three of you for joining me for, you know, our opening session and, and sharing just all the positivity and, and the wonderful things that have uh, come, come out of COVID-19 so far. <laughs> Um, we'll see each of you in just a little while when you come back to your sessions. Could you just real briefly just say the title of your session, Jesse? 
Sure. Mine is let's kick some math. I'm going to be showing some really awesome uh, tools that you may have never considered using in a math classroom. We're going to really stretch ourselves here. So this isn't, you know, your traditional math tools. We're going to take some tools that you've never thought about before for using for math and really pushing the way we could do things uh, in a creative way. Thanks, Jesse. T uh, Tammy? I'm going to be talking about something called Google Arts and Culture in Science. So <laughs> we're really stretching ourselves. I'll start with the science piece of it and hand it off to Jesse to go to the math piece of it. So, And Katie? Yeah, I'm going to be talking about using podcasts in the science classroom. Podcasts are the new essays is the title. And just, um, I know, especially in the virtual environment, uh, lab activities are really limited in science classrooms. So having students do some other collaborative activities with podcasts is what I'm going to talk about. Awesome. Thank you so much, everybody. I appreciate your time, and I'll see you a little later on today. Thanks. Bye. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so uh, we're going to switch. Uh, we're going to switch over and uh, welcome, Lewis. Good morning. Hey, good morning. How are you? Good morning. Um, welcome. Uh, Lewis is with us from Text Help. And you're going to be talking about Equatio, right, Lewis? I am. I just heard uh, the other sessions there. They sound great. Uh, I'd almost be curious to jump back in. I'll have to find out. Uh, I know you sent the schedule to us, so uh, I'm anxious to see some of those math sessions you have later on today. So Awesome. Are you going to be screen sharing with us? I am. I'm going to click that button right now, but I didn't think, uh, let's see. Tell me. Oh. Down in the bottom, you'll uh, yep, go ahead. Yep. yep. I heard. Yep. Tell me if you can see my Google Doc there, Lisa. Perfect. May I add it to the stream? Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. All right. Well, I'm going to take me off of here. You don't need me. <laughs> and I'm going to enjoy learning all about Equatio. Sure. Yeah. The only thing I would ask of you, Lisa, if you don't mind, is just kind of making sure I stay on time because Lisa, I, I obviously love my product. Um, I could probably go for a couple hours, but I know we only have 20 minutes. So uh, I totally get it. And if you don't mind maybe holding just a minute at the end, um, I'll bring in questions from the chat. Sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay. So, yep. So, uh, so thanks for having me, Lisa. My name's Louis Shanafelt, and I am the product manager slash evangelist. Everyone always laughs at that part of my title. Uh, I didn't give myself that name, but, uh, uh, so I am representing text help today and excited to give you guys a demo of Equatio and Equatio was founded about, about five years ago. And the principles behind Equatio was we're going to learn how to make math digital. You know, there just wasn't very many, uh, learning tools out there for teachers and students to be able to express themselves. Uh, but if you know anything about text help, you hopefully know that text help is uh, all about you know making everything inclusive for all learners. So we are an accessibility company. So not only are we going to make the math digital, we're also going to make it accessible. Um, so I'll show you a little bit of that as well. So uh, if you had joined me here on time, uh, you probably heard me kind of joke. You know, Equatio has uh, got many layers to it. Uh, so we're going to have to keep this very high level today because we only have the twenty minutes together, um, and we'll take some questions here at the end. So. You'll notice I had this already prepped for you. Uh, I just want you to know that Equatio is available in Google Docs, Google Slides, Google Sheets, Google Drawings, and most importantly for probably for teachers is it also can work in Google Forms, which is great for formative assessments, quizzes, and tests. I'm just gonna be in Google Docs today. Uh, we also work in Microsoft Word and Microsoft PowerPoint, and we also have integrations with learning management systems such as Canvas, Schoology, and Brightspace. So it's almost fair to say we work almost anywhere, uh, which is great because everyone uses different tools and different platforms. So that being said, you'll notice that I clicked on the Equatio Chrome extension here at the top already. And you'll also see that we have our Equatio toolbar here at the bottom. And one thing that's for certain, and, and Lisa, you probably know this, and I think the other man there, Jesse, you know, he's going to show some, some different math tools here later on today during this uh, summit. Uh, but one thing's for sure is that math has always, well, I felt, kind of got left behind when, you know, school started to go one to one. Uh, you know, it was always customary for kids to come to class, open their devices. But when we found that people were still going to math class, but the laptop sometimes didn't get out of the backpack. 
It was still get out your paper, pencil, let's take notes. The teacher was standing at the board. Well, one of the things about Equatio is it's built on UDL principles. So we allow kids to make math however they want. So we're gonna try and quickly go over as many of these buttons as we can. And I'm gonna show you how kids and teachers can express themselves with math. Uh, that being said, you might've noticed I clicked on this first button here, which is our equation editor. Uh, and Lisa, I have no idea everyone's math ability today. So we're gonna keep this kind of middle grades level. We're not gonna go too complex because I don't wanna lose any interest or uh, people's ability to understand the math. So if I was to say something like two X squared, I remember when I taught back in the classroom and I taught for 20 years, uh, you know, I often found myself teaching computer education along with math. And that was that was a struggle because I had so many math benchmarks uh, to teach as an algebra teacher, teacher, excuse me. And if I was to type two X squared, you know, I, I always thought, you know, do my students even know how to make the exponents? Do they know how to do subscripts? Do they know how to create fractions successfully? So what if in Equatio, we could just type 2x and then type the word that you need, which in this case is squared. So you'll notice that our prediction that's built into our product is saying, I think Louis wants to make squared here. So I'm just going to tap enter and you'll notice how quick and easy that is. Uh, and I always say this jokingly, Lisa, like I don't even like to go find the plus symbol with my with my fingers because I like to keep my fingers on the home row keys. So what if I just type PL and just tap enter? Or what if it was minus? Well, just type in M-I-N, tap enter. Or, you know, we try and think of all the different ways you could have subtraction. What if you just type in S-U-B, there subtract, tap enter. So we try and, like I said, think about all the different ways that kids want to make math. I'm going to go back to my original here, 2x squared plus, and let's say I do 3y, and now let's do another exponent. So let's go for cubed. So if I type in cu and just tap enter, you'll notice I have cubed. And then what about equals? So I can do eq and just tap enter. And you'll, you'll realize that if you were to try this product, uh, we do have free for teacher accounts. So teachers can go right to our website at texthelp.com uh, front slash equatio, and you can go and get a trial free premium license uh, as a teacher. Um, we do have many premium features though within the product. Uh, so keep that in mind, but we do have a free for teacher account for anyone that wants to make math. You'll notice here, if I was to actually need multiple lines of math, I could just tap the enter key. And when I tap the enter key, you might've noticed our palette here became a little bit more robust. We now are gonna think, well, now we're making multiple lines of math. And if we make multiple lines of math, we know kids struggle sometimes in math with uh, alignment and keeping things in rows and columns. So you'll see the alignment keys there. Uh, but again, we don't have a ton of time here today. So I just wanna show you what our math looks like when we insert it. And when I insert that math, uh, it should just pop itself right into the Google Doc. And oh boy, so let's check our permissions, right? I, I do bounce back and forth between developer build. So my apologies for not having the permissions already set up there. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and close Equatio now. And you'll notice how nice and neat that math just puts itself right into the Google Doc. Now remember with text help, since we are an accessibility uh, company, we wanna make sure that blind users, low vision users all have access uh, to this math. And what does that mean? Well, now that when I click on the picture of math that's been made, if I right click, I can go down to the alt text. The alt text, as you can see, if I was to actually pull up screen reading software here, like NVDA or JAWS, that math can then be read aloud for that type of user that needs that math. Or maybe it's not even a blind user. Think about all the students that might just need complex and sometimes basic math read aloud to them. This wording here in this alt text allows that to happen for a student. And I'm gonna jump on my toolbar here and show you actually what that looks like. Watch as I click on the screenshot reader and I'm gonna pull a box around this math I have no idea if you're gonna be able to hear this or not. It's probably gonna come through my headset here. Uh, forgive me if it doesn't play out loud. Yeah, so, so it's gonna play in my headset. I'm not actually at my house, so I apologize for not being able to hear that, but you'll notice that that math can be played aloud. Um, you'll also notice that if I click on more options, 
I can copy the LaTeX if I need it. I can copy the MathML, which is really great for users of Braille, or I can just pull this right back into Equatio. So let's say a student, for example, made a mistake. You might think, well, Louie, if they made a mistake, do I have to click on the picture and hit delete and start all over? No, you actually don't. You can just click on the picture here, go to edit math, and you can pull that image back into Equatio for editing. So let's say the three actually wasn't supposed to be cubed. I could just go here and hit the two. And then when I insert it, you'll also notice the picture will flip itself. And actually for our accessibility folks, this actually would change to the alt text right on the spot. So that then would change on that end as well. So we have lots of things in our equation editor, guys, which is really great. I mean, think about all the formulas, all the symbols that are used in math. Think about something like, I'm gonna take this a little bit further here, like Simpson's rule for integration. If I wanted to do Simpson's rule for integration, notice all I did was type in S-I-M-P, and there it is. It shows right up in prediction. Now imagine Lisa and our users here that are watching this webinar here today, imagine having to type this in character by character. I mean, it would take you an awful long time. If I didn't wanna make Simpson's rule of integration and I wanted something a little bit easier, what about the quadratic formula? Notice all I did was type in Q-U-A-D, tap enter, there's the quadratic formula and so forth. Not only do we have all the formulas in here, this is really a STEM tool. I often mistakenly say, hey, check out this new math tool, Equatio, but it's actually a STEM tool. Look at all the different types of chemical compounds you can make. So I can type in things like yields with heat, and I can have a catalyst above my yield symbol if I need it. So lots of different possibilities inside of our editor. We do have LaTeX editor in here for any advanced users that are, uh, that are used to using LaTeX. So feel free to uh, you know, kind of jump in. And if you're an advanced user, we'll actually make the LaTeX for you. Look, if I type the quadratic formula over here, we'll give you the LaTeX on the left-hand side of the screen. Also here, I know since uh, it sounds like we have some math people here uh, that are joining us today, look at our graph editor. We, you'll notice there it said activated and powered by Desmos. So we have partnered with Desmos here and I can type in things like, you know, Y equals, you'll notice Equatio prediction working right here. Let's say Y equals one fourth X minus two. And if we're doing slope intercept form, you know, Y equals MX plus B, Look at what happens when I click insert graph. It'll just nicely pop that coordinate plane right into the platform of choice. Any of the platforms that I mentioned at the start of this call. So I often think, you know, how else did I used to get a plane into my Google Doc? That was challenging. I'd go out to Google, I'd try and find a coordinate plane that I had the copyright and the authorization to use. I'd have to save that image, bring it in. Well, not, not anymore. With Equatio has the graphing built right in it. And with a premium account, you can have as many lines and as many things as you wanna make inside of Desmos's graph editor. So we have that. We also offer handwriting and I'm actually on a touchscreen device so I can scribble and you'll see three Y squared uh, minus two Y cubed equals eight. And that's not very good handwriting. I've, I've lacked obviously since things have all gone digital, but you'll see that even though the handwriting's not great, it picks it up and we can then insert that math into the document. Let's move to another input method. I often find my own daughter using speech recognition, right? And you probably have users that love using speech. I can say my math out loud and it'll annotate and record here on the right. Let's take a listen. 2x squared minus 4y cubed equals 18. And I can hit pause, 2x squared minus 4y cubed equals 18. And it'll, it'll, it'll transcribe that math, turn my spoken math into digital math, and then that can be inserted. Remember, we do have other inputs that I'm just not gonna have time to show today, but Equatio Mobile allows students to still do math on paper and pencil, and you can upload images of that math in paper and pencil, and Equatio will actually turn that handwriting into uh, digital math. Or you can just insert the image of the picture that you took. 
you know, for those math teachers that are like, hey, I still want to see my students' handwriting, Equatio Mobile would be your answer for that. We also have the screenshot reader, which I showed very quickly. And then most recently over the summer, Lisa, we added in the STEM tools here. And now we've put in an interactive periodic table so we can move this around. I remember when I went to school, if you wanted to see a periodic table, you had to get up out of your seat and go to the corner of the science classroom. And all the kids would kind of gather around to look at the one periodic table. Well, no more. You know, we have a fully interactive periodic table. So if I wanted to learn more about nickel, I can do that. And if we don't have what you need here with nickel, we do have the Wiki, excuse me, the Wikipedia links here for you as well. So you can look at those. And the last two things here, uh, before I jump to one last thing, is we also partnered with Desmos once again with a fully functional scientific calculator. By the way, this is the exact scientific calculator that's used throughout the United States. I believe this calculator in particular is featured on 35 of the 50 United States. Uh, this, this calculator in particular is used on end of course exams and statewide assessments. So we have partnered with Desmos once again for the calculator. And this is really, really cool here. The last thing I'm gonna show you in the STEM tools is a molecular viewer. Uh, so if I was to type in something like hydro, you'll notice the prediction pop up. So let's choose hydrocortisone and I can look at a fully rendered 3D object here uh, and I can check out what the proteins are for the element. We can zoom in, uh, we can change the views. So we have a few different views here. If I wanted to look at this from a spherical perspective, we could really zoom in and look at it this way as well. So a really neat molecular viewer that we added into the product. And last but not least, I had one other tab here that I really wanted to show, and that is Equatio Math Space. So we did not build or design Equatio Math Space for remote learning, but as you can probably uh, understand, our usage in Equatio has been up about tenfold. So, uh, you know, it's up almost a thousand percent across where we were one year ago. And you'll notice that I can use my instructional design and my creativeness to build a math space here. Let's just pull one random one and then we'll take some questions. Let's choose this one. Let's go down to like some fifth grade math. We're going to give users a white canvas here, if you will. And you'll notice that you're going to be able to add slides here or whatever you wanted to call them, additional math space spaces. And you can provide basically a full template here of problems. You can do lesson plans through here. However you wanted to utilize math space, we encourage you to try as many methods as you want. What's important here is I can click on this share button. So once I'm done creating this space, click share, and then check this out. I can share this with a colleague. So think about, I'm gonna share this with an adult that I co-teach with, or my neighbor down the hallway, or maybe I'm the math curriculum coach for a district and I wanna share this out with you know 10,000 teachers that I, that I work with. You can do that, or you can send this math space and check this out, expect a response. What does that look like? Well, what's gonna happen is, is you, the teacher, can take this Equatio link and you can put it right in your Google Classroom or maybe you have a Canvas LMS for your district. Take the link and put it in Canvas. Take the link and put it with whatever ed tech tool that you use as a school and as a district and you're gonna share this link with your students. So that being said, take this link. The students then will get their own copy of this math space and I know we're running short on time here, but the students are gonna have a little blue and white paper airplane when they open up that link. So they're gonna be able to use all these Equatio tools. Uh, and by the way, I didn't even show you all the shapes we have in here, but look at all the different shapes and possibilities we have in here for you as a teacher. So we can use coins, we can use algebra tiles, Venn diagrams, you name it. So think about you know, the different possibilities that you can create whatever you want and by the way, if you, we don't have something in our drawer that you like, you can bring in your own files. Here's import files. So you can bring in your own pictures or your own items. Uh, you'll see back on my dashboard, like the picture of the actual cookie. So you can bring in gingerbread men. You can bring in Christmas tree activity. You know, we, we, you know, we kind of fall into this trap where we want to make math engaging. We want to make it interactive. And most of all, I think it goes back to my initial part of this conversation, which is we want kids to want to come to class and be excited about learning math and science. And however we can get there, 
I think Mass Space personally is a great way to do that and make interactive uh, activities for students. Uh, Lisa, am I about out of time now? You're not actually, but I'm not. Okay. Okay. No, there's some phenomenal questions. Okay. Uh oh. <laughs> so should I take questions or keep going? Well, can you. I ask you a couple of questions before you shoot? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Let's go so, start. Um, so we had a couple of folks talk. I think it was Efren who's just like, "This is great to use in chemistry class." And then Suta came in and said, "Can we update the database equation in Equatio? For example, he wants to store all of his physics equations in there." Ah, so I, I don't know who asked that. I didn't catch the name, but Lisa, I just put literally myself two hundred and thirty-five physics formulas into our prediction. So within the last two months, and let me show this because I have this actually bookmarked uh, for this particular user. Uh, someone had requested this, I think, up in the northeastern part of the United States. And they said, hey, you know, Louie, I'd love to put some physics formulas in. I clicked on it. What happened here? I wanted to take you to a website and show you all the different physics formulas that we just put in. Here it goes. So someone, a professor had said, hey, Louie, here's, here's like the Bible for all physics formulas. And do you think we could get these added into the product? And one thing about text help, Lisa, is like we, we wholeheartedly listen to customer feedback. You know, when they provide feedback and, and that's something that we think can benefit multiple users, we'll do the work. So notice when I hover over this formula, it's called centripetal acceleration. Uh, I'm not a physics uh, major by any means. But if you actually search in our prediction for centripetal, let me type that in, it should be in here um, because I one by one, and there it is, centripetal acceleration. So that website right there is what I use. So think about all the different formulas and physics that, you, that you know, folks would use. We literally one by one, actually I one by one, I used our screenshot reader and one by one put a box around it we grab the law tech, we can, we can read the math, we can read the science from anywhere. And you can literally, actually, I'll show it to you real quick. Notice we don't have the Equatio toolbar here at the bottom, but when I do click on the extension, look here, I still get my screenshot reader. And I know you guys won't be able to hear this, but what I can do is pull a box around any of these formulas. I don't care how complex it is. Let's try this one here. Uh, I hope I didn't get too much of that zero subscript that was hanging down. And our Equatio screenshot reader can read that formula. So we're, I'm hearing in my headset the pronunciation for that formula. And then look what I can do. I can copy that formula. And I think you'll love this. Look, I just copied the LaTeX from that physics website. And watch, I'm going to paste the LaTeX now. And when I paste it, Look at that, it puts it right into Equatio. And here's the best part, Lisa, is remember the accessibility piece. On this website, that, that, this, these formulas are not accessible for a blind user. But now that I've put it into Equatio and I've inserted it, guess what's gonna be behind this picture? That alt text. So now I have users here that would be able to participate and understand what that math and formula says and looks like. Okay, mind blown. I thought I knew what Equatio did. I knew like one eighth of what Equatio, yeah. Equatio did. Um, and your viewers are, are super excited about awesome. it. Um, so uh, one of the questions was, does Equatio work with Illuminate? Illuminate. So, you know, there's so many different platforms out there. I personally am not familiar with Illuminate. Okay. You're welcome. I'm going to go ahead and put my uh, my email address here. If you want to email me, I'd be glad to follow up on this. So just louie at texthelp.com. Um, here's what Equatio can do. So I think the user might be able to answer their own question here, Lisa. Let me show you something real quick here, guys. Let's say that I want to put this right here in Illuminate. Okay, even though I'm not familiar with Illuminate, I know you are. So let's call you the Illuminate expert. This is what I want you to try. Put your math inside Equatio, but you don't need to insert it into the doc. You want this math in Illuminate. So if you're a premium customer with that free for teacher license, go to this copy math as button and look at the possibilities here. We'll give you the URL to make that math. You can download it or you can just copy it to your clipboard. So the reality is, is it's probably, I'm going to click image PNG. You'll notice copied lights up. 
And then I can go paste this image from the clipboard into Illuminate. So you'll know better than me whether Illuminate is willing to accept a PNG file. If it will take the picture file, then yes, we work with Illuminate. <laughs> that makes sense. And then thanks for, for answering that. Sure. And then um, just speaking about accessibility, um, was there a talk to text option or a voice to text option? So we, we have the speech input button that I demoed where users can hear the math and say the math out loud. But I will tell you the speech input built within Equatio is only listening for math. So let's say I was interrupted right now and my daughter walked into my room and started to say, hey dad, can I go outside? If speech input was turned on, it's not gonna hear, hey dad, can I go outside? Because there's no math in, hey dad, that can I go outside? But if, you know, if I said, hey, Johnny, return to your seat, it's going to hear two, but it thinks it heard to the numeral, not T-O-2. So our speech input is, is designed to only listen to and recognize math. You probably would have more success if you're looking for the talk and type to just use the built-in talk and type through Google Docs. Um, or you could use our, our flagship product, Read and Write for Google Chrome. Um, and you can certainly use that to make, uh, you know, to use for literacy class. So, um, so thanks, Louis. Uh, listen, I think that you have everybody's attention. So, uh, do you mind taking another couple of minutes to show us a few more things? Yeah, I have time. Yes, please. Okay, per perfect. So you know what I'd really like to do, which I didn't know that I'd have time, is I want to show you guys, I'll go back to this math space right here. Remember how I said, we want to be able to create things here and we want to be able to share those back with our students. So I want to show you what that's going to look like from the student perspective. So when I make a copy for each person and expect a response, I want to show you what this looks like. And because I'm a Google certified trainer, what I typically do is I use my own training domain and I'm going to copy this link. And now I'm going to go to an entirely different Chrome account here, guys. I'm going to use that uh, trainer account. And I am now going to put on my student hat. So I'm no longer Louis the teacher. Think about me as Louis the student. And slowly but surely here, I'm on a uh, little jetpack here, Lisa. So patience, I hope. It's slowly loading. Uh, so you're going to like this because I think when you open this math space from the student side, you're now going to see all those different UDL input methods that I've tried to go over with you. I know it's been an abbreviated demo here, but students can use anything they see on our toolbar to show their understanding. And that kind of goes back to, you know, we're trying to make that transition from paper pencil math because not every student is going to be able to, you know, to be able to show their understanding potentially on paper pencil. They might elect to choose one of these other methods. So students can use any of these methods on the toolbar. And I'm going to be a, actually, I'm going to be a really bad student here. And I'm not going to answer this. You guys didn't show up today to watch me do the volume of a cone anyway. I'm just going to put hi, okay? And I'm going to send this back to my teacher. So you'll see that, you know, hey, congratulations. This has been shared to your teacher. So now I'm going to leave my student Google Trainer account here. Okay, so bear with me. And now I'm going to return to my Equatio dashboard, which I think I accidentally closed. So let me reopen that. And I want, to, I want you guys to now see what the teacher's gonna see when students start to send in those submissions. What I have here on my original dashboard before I went into that volume uh, scenario with you is these buttons over here. And I didn't show these yet, but what did I just do? I created an assignment for a student. So click on assignments and you're going to notice that I, Louie, have a submission to grade. It says right here and it's lit up blue. So when I click on this, it'll show all those student submissions. Now, in a realistic world, you guys might collect 120, you know, depending on what you teach, but I can open this. Now, I'll also tell you some recent work that we just completed is we used to have to have users open 120 Chrome windows to give 120 student submissions the feedback. Well, not anymore. Uh, so I suggested to our development team we need to make this better. We need to give teachers more time. You know, teachers value time, right? 
So I'm introducing to you, if you've never seen this before, or maybe you saw Equatio three years ago, you would not have seen this because this was just released. Notice right here, I now have what we call our rapid reviewer. Now you'll notice I only have one response here, right? But what you'll have the opportunity to do, and you can probably see the writing on the wall here, you'll be able to quickly click the right arrow key to scroll through the responses and provide the feedback here. I'll also have a drop down window. Again, there's only one response, but if you had 120, it'll be right there all collected for you. And I can provide feedback and say, Louis, you didn't follow the directions and my spelling is off. Uh, here we go. And I can click send feedback. Now, Louis, the student, will be able to get a Chrome notification saying, you've received feedback from Mr. Shanafelt. You know, you need to go look at that feedback. So what would I then do as a student? If I flip back to my, my Equatio dashboard as a student, where am I gonna go? Well, as a student, you're gonna go to the things you've submitted, right? So I'm gonna go to my submitted assignments. This is if you didn't see the notification, by the way. And I say hello to myself here a lot, as you can see. And I'm gonna open up and look for that feedback that the student gave. So you'll see when this opens that I, the student, I'm gonna be able to go in here and say, you know, did my teacher, you know, enjoy the feedback? You know, did my teacher leave me feedback? What does that feedback look like? And there it is, Louis, you didn't follow directions. So what do I then need to do as a student? Why is my Equatio toolbar grayed out? Because we want you to read the feedback before you go and make your corrections. So what do I have to do as a student? Turn off the feedback view, okay? Turn off the feedback view. You're then going to get the full toolbar. If you don't wanna see this, you can hide it. And then I, as a student would say, well, that obviously wasn't what my teacher wanted to see. Get rid of the nonsense, go create the math or the STEM content that you need to create. Uh, last thing here, I wanna show you guys one last thing. And then uh, I, I thought we can use Math Space for more than just sending out one space for students. So I came up with the idea, what if a teacher made an entire lesson plan? What if the teacher said, I'm gonna build an entire lesson in a math space? How would I, what would that look like You know, uh, from the teacher side? What would that look like from the student side? So here is an example of a full lesson plan that I built out in Math Space that says, here kids, we're gonna learn about solving systems of equations today. And I'm gonna show you on page two, you know, the substitution method, for example. I'm gonna give them notes. I'm gonna show them how to do the math. By the way, all of this was created with Equatio. And then guess what? Another cool thing to kind of showcase here is our graph editor. Now that you know what X and Y are, show me that intersection there. And there it is. So, and then by the way, as you scroll down here, you'll see the elimination example. And then what do you think I want my kids to do? I want them to try some problems on their own. Now that the lesson's been taught, uh, I want you to try some of these on your own. So not only are they gonna get the lesson plan in the math space, they're also gonna receive potentially the homework right in the math space. Wow. Yep. This is amazing. Thank you so much for sharing. Yep. Appreciate with us. Ab absolutely. I, I enjoyed being here. I appreciate the invite. Uh, let me click stop screen so people aren't seeing duplicates. So <laughs> Lisa, at least I appreciate the, uh, you know, the introduction, you letting me join today. Uh, hopefully people have my email address. If you have questions or any follow up, it's just Louie at texthelp.com. Uh, and I think Lisa is going to bring in your next presenter, right, Lisa? Yeah. And actually, Louie, I'll just read you the last comment from the chat. Oh, just cool. I, I want to send you off just with okay. Okay. This was amazing. God, I just installed the Chrome oh, I see. and I used it on Docs. <laughs> yeah, very cool. Yeah, and, and Efren's a good friend of mine. Efren, Efren's a, a you know, a, you know, loves our product. I appreciate him joining today, and it looks like we got some good feedback there from folks. So, uh, yeah. you know, Suta, I appreciate yeah, the kind word. The Philippines. It's one yeah. o'clock morning there. Oh, oh boy. <laughs> oh, it's a good dedication then. So, well, thanks for joining me, everybody that decided to come today. And Lisa, thanks again for having us at Text Help. We appreciate you, uh, you know, getting us into your schedule so people could see all the potential here. I mean, the potential with Equatio, like I said, I could go for two hours demoing the product. And I know that was very high level, but I appreciate your all's attention and, 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 and hopefully you enjoyed the, the quick overview today. I did. Thank you. All right. Hey, thanks so much. Bye, Lisa. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. 
So I'm going to bring our next speaker into the stream. Uh, Katie Fielding is going to be sharing with us uh, podcasts are the new essays, science edition. And Katie, let me add your deck to the stream. And um, welcome back. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I think it went back to your other deck. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. No. Yep. There we go. Um, and for, for those of you watching, I just put in the chat the link to this Wakelet resource so you can get all the resources that I am talking about today. Um, so I'm talking to you about podcasts and um, how you can use those in the science classroom. Okay, let's see. All right. So... I always like to go back to the ISTE standards for students and for teachers, and we really want to be creating a culture of creation in our schools. And so this is one way you can have students creating um, material. Um, and I love it because a lot of students, you know, video is a great medium, but a lot of students don't want to show their face. Um, but they are, you know, very apt to talk. So podcasting is a great option for those students. Um, I always like to provide my students options um, with what they're going to be creating. And so I think podcasting is a great, great option to add to your arsenal. And it's not as complicated as it might sound, um, and it's not as technical as it, as it could be. Um, so I'm going to show you some like hacks to make podcasting easy in your classroom. Um, so again, we want to be designing authentic stuff for our students to create and do, and this is one way to do that. So why do we want our students to be podcasting? Well, it's a really great way to, like I talked, amplify their voice, letting them talk and say stuff, um, building those 21st century skills with podcasting. Students can do graphic design for their, their podcast cover album. They can um, audio remix and edit audio and um, also publish to the web. So a lot of um, those 21st century skills can be built into a podcasting project. Also, podcasting um, can be, you know, you can communicate and have people as a guest on your podcast worldwide so they can make connections with people they interview and um, make it a really outside the classroom experience, whether you're home uh, doing remote learning or actually in a physical classroom. All right, so some ways that we can do it in science class particularly. So students um, can do unit reviews. So I taught an AP course. And so at the end of the school year before the AP test, I would assign each group a different topic that we had done earlier in the year. So each group uh, had a, you know, a unit of topic and they would have to create a podcast around that topic and discussing you know, all the stuff that then their classmates could then listen to as a review. But not just you know, saying the facts or the things that people need to know, but really discussing and getting into those deep, uh, intricate details of the science topic um, and sharing you know, any application or their own worldview on that topic in the podcast. Another way would be to do audio lab reports. Um, and so students you know, could do a lab activity and then discuss the outcomes, because really in science, we want them discussing the process. And um, the, you know, sometimes, especially for L students, that can be hard to do on paper, but they could do it really well in a late oral format. Or, um, so it's great, another great option to add to that lab report way to submit one. Uh, and then current events. Obviously, like any current event uh, topic podcast, students can debate topics or ruminate on what they think the future of a technology might be and really get to thinking and, um, again, putting their voice into what's going on in the world. Um, I think while we're remote learning, I know my district has really restricted um, the lab activities that can be done at home. Um, it, it's even like not advised, you know, um, for them to use like even vinegar <laughs> for a home activity. So students and teachers are really limited in what they can assign students in the science classroom to do at home that's more interactive. And so I think podcasting can really take place of um, some of those activities and getting the students to collaborate in a group because that's a big part of science is the collaboration. And science is really a creative endeavor too. Um, and so this podcasting option can give students that creative um, thinking to put something together um, that they might have done previously in a lab activity. Um, so in my wakelet here, I have a hyperdoc. I think it's always good to introduce students to what 
podcasting is. And in this hyperactivity, students get introduced to what podcasting is and then create a little mini podcast. So if you like to use hyperdocs in your classroom, this is a great place to start with the podcasting uh, concept. Because a lot of students think when I talk about podcasting at first, they think it's YouTubers. Because I guess a lot of YouTubers have a podcast as well, which is just an audio feed of their YouTube channel. But really getting them to see that podcasting is just the audio. It's not a visual um, you know, thing. Is It's a new frame for them. And they, they don't quite know what it is initially. Um, so getting um, going into podcasting deeper, if your students really get into it, NPR has some great resources, as well as a challenge every year, a competition, where students can submit their podcasts and enter them into the competition. Another great thing to do before you have students start making podcasts is have them listen to podcasts. So I've listed some really great science podcasts. The first four are really geared for like that K-6 group. Um, so they're more for, for children. Um, and then um, Wow in the World, that is an amazing podcast by Guy Raz, who you've probably heard if you listen to NPR, and Mindy Thomas. Um, so the first four are great options for that K-6 group. And the last two, um, Shortwave and Science Versus, those are definitely more for the high school, middle school, uh, upper middle school set. Get them listening to podcasts and um, before they make them. That way they have a real concept of what it's going to be that they're creating. Okay, hey, Lisa. Lisa yeah. Yeah. Um, we never got the link to the Wakelet, and and we oh. love to have it. Yes. Is it there now? I think, yeah, it's there. I put it in the 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 YouTube chat. I see it in the stream. Is it not? Uh, no, it's not showing up. Let's see. I'll Do refresh the page. In the private chat for me, and I'll. Post I can it. put it. Yeah, I can put it there too. Thank you. I'm sorry. To yeah. No, no, it's fine. That should be, yep, oh, oh. Is that the right one? Yeah, that's the right oh. one, yeah. <laughs> oh, all right, gosh. all right, good. Um, all right, um, all right. So you have them listen to podcasts, get familiar with what it is. And also some really great podcasts to have um, students listen to are the ones from the NPR competition to see what other students have made. That way they can get a realistic like expectation of, you know, ours isn't going to be done in a full studio, but what can we make? Um, and kids can, kids in the competition make some fantastic podcasts. Another great thing about the podcasting process is very much like the writing process. So getting students to do that planning, recording, producing, and publishing process is very much like the writing plot process of planning, drafting, write, uh, revising, and then finalizing a draft. So it's a great way to, to emulate that same writing process in a different medium. Um, I really like, um, so I'm gonna kind of skip over this for time, but some hardware recommendations. You see I'm using a really nice fancy mic. Um, my colleague, Billy Watts, has come up with this great list that I like to share with people. Um, I'm using the Rode Pod mic that's on the list, the prosumer mic. And it involves uh, actually having a digital interface, which is listed here, the Scarlett 1818. And that puts a really nice sound. It's a dynamic mic. So the sound um, from like outside of my room is really blocked out and you get a really professional sound, but you do not have to have that when working with students. Um, my school has gone and built a podcast studio, which is really great. But if you just have the mic in your uh, in your computer uh, in the Chromebook, that is completely adequate to like get kids started in the idea of podcasting. Also, if you work with high schoolers, getting them to do that on their phones is also super effective. So whatever you have at your disposal is where you can use to start podcasting. The software is where you can get more um, detailed. I really like with under 13 kids to start podcasting in a Google slide presentation. It gets them doing the process of podcasting without the actual public publishing. And for students under 13, we have to remember their privacy with FERPA and COPA. So we don't want them always publishing things out into the world, especially without parental um, permission. So if you're doing a class project where you're putting people in groups, it's probably best to do something like the Google slide. So I like to do use, I have this template listed in the um, Wakelet. Put the Google slide in a one by one uh, shape. 
just like a CD cover or um, a podcast album cover, of course. Um, I like to have kids design the podcast cover, either using Canva and they have uh, in Canva, if you're familiar with that tool, they have CD cover template or in Adobe Spark, if you use that tool, both of these tools are Google education partners. Um, you can pick the Instagram cover, which is a one by one format, and students can use that as a starting place to design their cover. You can see even in uh, Adobe Spark, they can save that image right to their Google Drive. So I like to have you know one kid in the group be the, the designer of the, of the podcast album. I like to have another student in the group be the producer. Another student is the main um, speaker or the two other people are the main speaker and interviewers. So people can have different jobs and that's how they can collaborate on doing a podcast together. Um, all right, so in this one, I've put an image here already. This is my Google uh, slide. And then I just have to have them record audio and put the audio onto the slide. So I like to, in simple, you know, the K6 group, um, just use the cloud audio recorder. This is a great website where students can just come here, press start, record some audio, keep talking. You know, you could have two kids speaking into one mic discussing something. Then they stop. They just the click export as MP3 and then click and save it to their Google Drive. Once it's saved to their Google Drive, they can go right back over to Google Slides, go to Insert, Audio, and then find that audio slide or that audio file and import it right into the slide. And you see that now in the top little corner, and this can be moved around if you want, but that audio bit is there. And so now this podcast is created and students can share this just with the teacher or just with their classmates. So again, it's not public out into the world, but they've made and gone through that podcast creation process. So that's something I really like to do again with that 13 and under group. With older kids, like I mentioned my school, we have a podcast studio. I really love using tools like Soundtrap. Soundtrap is another, um, uh, Google partner, Google for education partner. Uh, you can even import your whole Google classroom into that, um, your roster. Um, I love it because there's a lot of mixing that students can do. So higher level auto editing, it auto transcribes. So for accessibility, I think it's really important to teach students that they need to make their the content they create accessible. So that transcript they can put in their show notes. So someone who who has a hearing impairment can still access the content that they've created in their podcast. Um, Soundtrap is a great tool for higher level podcasting experiences. So, you know, if you're a journalism class or a yearbook class and you're documenting something over time, that is probably a more um, uh, professional tool to introduce students to using. For the one-off projects, I think the, the Google slide is great. For longer term podcasting projects, go a little more professional with sound Soundtrap. Um, after you create your um, podcast and Soundtrap, you have to export the MP4 or MP3. And I like to have students publish in Anchor. It's a very easy platform to publish to. Um, and it, it automatically is in Spotify. Uh, but there are lots of podcasting um, tools that you can publish with that are free to use. Um, and I have some of those listed here, like Podomatic. So those are some things to do. And lastly, again, those cover art tools that I shared. Um, Canva and Adobe Spark are here in the Wakelet. Um, so that is a quick overview of doing some podcasting that you can do in science class. Obviously, you can do it in math class too. Math topics can, um, can definitely be applied to podcasting. Uh, Lisa, were there any other questions? Yeah, so I just asked in the chat if there were any questions for you. I think that we're all like, whoa, my <laughs> gosh. Like, yeah, it was a lot for 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Once we posted the, you know, the link to the wakelet um, and we treated it out. So everybody's looking okay. at it. Um, <laughs> yeah, and so the, the template for that, um, the Google slide is there right here in this um even another Wakelet link to this that gives you step by step of how to do it with your students. So um, you can use that as a, like a lesson plan to help you, you know, this is all the steps we're going to do with students to podcast in Google Slides. Sure. And I'd love it if you would speak to maybe um, some specific math and science or science examples of um, what uh, students have been using it for. 
Yeah, so I taught um, AP environmental science and I taught um, oceanography. And so in oceanography, we always had a, a human impacts on the ocean unit. And so I would have students create podcasts or podcasting being one choice, videos or social media campaigns being other choices, because I like to provide students choices. Um, so in their their choice of podcast, they would, you know, create a podcast, um, educating and then talking about issues like plastic pollution or whaling, um, where they could really, you know, research the topic, just like they might for a paper, and then share what they've learned and then share their um, opinions and thoughts on that topic and, um, you know, how science has in science shapes society and society shapes science. Awesome. And, and, um, there's a question from the chat, just what tools are you having your students use to collaborate? Yeah. So right now in virtual learning, um, we're virtual students can record the audio from a zoom meeting or a Google meet. They can record that and they can use that as their 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 audio that they put in the podcast. Soundtrap itself is collaborative. So two people can log go into the studio and Soundtrap, that tool I shared, and they, or two or more, uh, can go in and they both record audio right there and edit there together in Soundtrap itself. So those are really collaborative platforms. How do you handle permissions for uh, students publishing outside of the walls of their building? Yeah, so that's why I recommend the Google Slides definitely for the 13 and under because then it's not truly published and you don't have to worry about that. But for those like journalism classes, yearbook classes, we do get the parental permission if they do you know, want to publish outside. And Katie, would you tell us a little bit about your podcast? Oh, um, I have a podcast with some colleagues. We're all tech coaches, and it's mostly for our, uh, geared towards our district. And we just talk about different ed educational topics. So this past week we talked about Zoom engagement, and next week we're talking about you know using zeros and grading and our feelings about that. So it's a little bit of like the uh, we recently had a listener tell us it was the staff meeting you you want to listen to. So. <laughs> 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 and what tools, um, where do you host that? Oh, we host it actually on Anchor, the one I mentioned, the podcast hosting service. Yep. And um, we edit with Soundtrap and we've been recording because we're all remote in Zoom. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Katie, thank you so much for your yeah. time today. We Thanks for having me. Taking the time to share with us and, and for talking with us on the panel this morning. And I hope that you enjoy the rest of your Saturday. <laughs> yeah, you guys too. Thanks so much. All right. Thanks, Katie. Bye. Um, so we're going to take just a quick break before uh, we bring in our next speaker. I want to remind everyone that you can go to gsummit.link link slash Acer and submit to win not only um, a boot camp or a summit ticket from Apps Events, but we also are going to be giving away some um, explain everything codes. And one of our speakers coming up is going to be giving away a couple of copies of his book. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, just introduce that our next speaker, uh, Tammy Lind, is here to talk about Google Arts and Culture in the Blended Science Classroom. If you haven't toured Google Arts and Culture before, uh, this is um, amazing, amazing product. I'm going to go ahead and add uh, Tammy to the stream. And um, Tammy, you're all set? I am. You should have my, do you have my screen? Uh, yep. There we go. All right. All right. Good. Thanks for joining us again, again today, Tammy. Awesome. I'm really excited. This is actually one of my favorite things to talk about. So can you see the screen deck okay? Absolutely. Perfect. All right. So we're going to get started. I know some of you are probably thinking arts and culture, science, what, where does that go? Um, arts and culture is one of my absolute favorite things to talk about in science and math and history and literacy. And I really firmly believe it can be used in any content area uh, with a lot of different grade levels. I wanna just, I'm gonna take a little bit of time to just talk about it and then we're gonna get in and, and actually look at it hands-on. Um, and I will just tell you in 20 to 25 minutes, it's we're going to scratch the little tiny, tiny surface of arts and culture. So I would encourage you to take anything that we talk about and dig deeper as we're talking or uh, at, at your leisure later. So when we get into arts and culture, 
Uh, it, it just is artsandculture.google.com. That's how you're going to get there. Now, in our time together, we're going to be looking specifically at the various science applications to this. I have three areas of arts and culture that I'm going to specifically talk about. And I'm really excited that Jesse is following up this session with uh, Google Earth and some of the AR, VR type things uh, that we can do as well, because a lot of that is built right in to arts and culture. So this is a great segue um, into that. So with that, I'm going to actually leave this uh, slide deck and I'll put the link uh, to the slide deck into the chat. But I wanna go right into arts and culture and I would really recommend to you, if you are listening um, and are the type of learner that likes to click around and do it while I'm talking, go ahead. Um, if you want to watch and then play later, you can do that as well. So if we get to artsandculture.google.com, this is your homepage. And oddly enough, we could spend a long time just on the homepage because it changes. It changes based on what's happening around the world. It changes based on the time of the year. And just as you land in arts and culture, you will also see right here, you have an app that you can download. I would highly recommend downloading the app and taking a look at some of the things we're gonna do today on the app because there's just some differences and more interactive features in the app as opposed to the web version of it, which is what we're going to look at. So I'm going to keep going. I'm literally just on the home page, so we haven't left yet. Uh, anything that you might be looking for related to art, culture, science, as I said, history, any of that is all built right into one spot. And it what they did what Google did was it took collections and, and artifacts from museums around the world and put them all in one place. In addition to that, they built in virtual reality. And now, if you look here, they built in augmented reality as well onto this site. Uh, and this is relatively new. The augmented reality uh, piece of it is relatively new. They also have the ability to... Uh, visit places around the world with different um, uh, information on those places. And we know, I love that Katie talked about creation and she talked about the ISTE standards. We know that digital literacies are so important. And being able to filter through the mass amount of information that is coming at us so fast. And what I love about it is all of the information in arts and culture you can find out exactly where that has come from and who it is attributed to. So I love this also as a way to work with kids on that, that digital knowledge and digital content. All right, so this is just the homepage. I just wanted to give you kind of that end game of where we're headed in the next 20 or so minutes uh, and some of the options that we have in arts and culture. And I realize you probably now have tuned me out and you're exploring and that's totally fine. Please do that. There are three main things that I wanna show you. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the creation pieces of it and then we'll wrap it up. The first thing that I wanna make sure to highlight in arts and culture is the ability to pull out 360 videos. And again, we're, our focus here is science. So I'm going to show you two specific videos related to science that you can find here. Before I do that, I want you to know right here, you have the ability to share this right through Google Classroom. So if you are a Google Classroom user, you can actually create an assignment, an announcement, a question, anything that you need to would be available to here in Classroom. You also, have the ability to copy the link. So if you're not a classroom user, you can put it into Schoology or into other um, learning management systems that you might be using. You can also just share the link directly with kids. Um, and just as an aside, with some of our youngers that may not be using Classroom, we may share this out uh, through GoGuardian or some other resources that we use with our kids, with our youngers. All right, so in the 360 video, I'm gonna scroll down here and I wanna show you what the virtual reality, some of the virtual reality videos look like. And I have them open already. And what you're looking at right here is you are inside the space shuttle. And as I'm grabbing, clicking and dragging, 
you can see that we can look around as the video, I'll go ahead and play it, as the video is playing, and it's okay if you're not getting sound, um, I just want you to see what the video looks like. So I can actually look around while I'm listening to the content. I love this for kids. It provides that audio feedback, it provides that video feedback, and oh, by the way, it's interactive in that I can really pay attention to what I wanna look at. The other video, and I'll come back, the place that I got to this is the 360 videos in arts and culture. The other video that I want to just show you is the tour of the Hubble Control Center. So I'm gonna hit, hit play. What I like about this video, and hopefully you'll see it in a second, is that it's also closed caption. I love that Katie talked about accessibility and some of the important features in accessibility. I'm a special educator by trade. I'm an instructional coach now, um, but accessibility is a big, big deal uh, when we're, we're in a remote and a hybrid environment. So I'm really glad that Katie touched on that and also know that a lot of this is closed caption as well. So these are the 360 videos available to you in arts and culture. You can see the little icon here. And this is what you have. There are so many more that you can get lost in. We're gonna actually look at one a little bit later um, in something called an, a theme and a collection. But these are built in to a lot of the different topics that are available to you. All right. Very quickly, in case I didn't mention it, just to move around in arts and culture, you're going to, you can use these tools here, or you can click on the little hamburger menu right over here. When I click on that, I get some options here. All right, so those are the 360 videos in science. Now, I wanna move on, and this is where I really lose people. This is usually uh, something I would save for the very, very end, but I have to show you, because we're talking about science, is the experiments right here that are available in arts and culture. And I have them open. And this is what they look like. Now, I will just be very honest with you. There are really great experiments having nothing to do with math and science, but we are going to stay focused on math and si on science uh, in particular. Uh, what I love about these is these truly are just things that people are trying related to arts and culture. And as you can see here, this is online artwork interpreting climate data. Um, and I'm not gonna open the experiment, but I want you to know that it's here. As I scroll down, don't worry, I'm gonna open two of them. As I said, I'm gonna show you two of everything that I'm talking about. And just remember the slide deck that I shared with you, everything that, that you will need to go back to arts and culture is in that slide deck. So as I'm scrolling down here, this is the one that I, I wanted to hit right here is the timelines. So I have the timeline experiment opened already. And what this is, is it's tracking um, the glacial retreat over time. And so if you look at that, and it's talking about climate change and it will actually document the glacial retreat um, as we move through history. And I think what I really love about this is it's that visual for our kids. You know, those are the things that sometimes in a hybrid or in a virtual environment, you know, we don't have that face to face to kind of read where kids are and what they're learning. We can really interact with them through these experiments. The other thing that I think is really fun in this one is called what we eat. This is also an experiment. What this does is it tracks uh, your CO2 footprint of things that you're eating. You can actually create a little mini menu and then it will calculate your output um, and we'll let you know if, if that is a good thing to eat or not. And you can see, I'm not gonna actually open it while we're on the call because um, just as an aside, some of these experiments are pretty big bandwidth users. So just be cognizant of that. So those are experiments in arts and culture. And again, if I click here, go to the hamburger menu, we have our experiments. The, the other thing that I wanted to touch on are the themes and the collections, and these are big. So themes, obviously themes are around one particular topic. Collections are big. Collections are these things that are taken from museums from around the world. So as an example, if I go over to the search item, which is over here at the little magnifier, 
and I click on Science Museums, this will actually pull up museums from around the world that I may want to take a look at. For example, we have the, the National Science Museum in, in uh, South Korea we can look at. These are collections from the particular museum. Stories are bits that have been pulled out of these museums and put together for us on various topics. We're actually going to look at a couple of these in a second. And then you have items. Items are individual artifacts from each museum. Okay, so I'm going to use my back arrow here. Those are collections. Collections are from specific museums. And again, going back to digital literacy, all of the information is, is attributed and you can find out exactly where um, that information is coming from. But I want to show you some of the themes because I think this is really where we, we venture into the, the science and, and what we want our kids to take from that. And that is this first one. So this is called Take a Plunge into the Great Barrier Reef. And again, what I love about this is it's shareable. If I click here, it's shareable uh, to Google Classroom or through the link. As I scroll down, look at the images. These are images that kids may not ever have the opportunity to see. I love just the high quality video, the high quality images built into arts and culture. And I know that you're gonna be looking at that too with Jesse in the next um, section. So as we scroll down, there are lots of things about the Great Barrier Reef. If I go here, I can click on that. And here I have a collection about it. I have specific stories about the reef. And then as I mentioned before, I had specific items about the reef. The last one that I want to show you, or one other one that I want to show you, and then we're going to talk about galleries, is uh, another theme, again, pulled from different collections, pulled from different areas, but all on the same topic. So this is actually a theme on invention and discovery. So if I scroll down, now I'm an elementary, oh, here, before I say that, uh, I love that it talks about the augmented reality um, that we have here in this theme. As I scroll down, you can see some of the inventions over time. And of course, I'm from the elementary perspective, so we must know who invented the toilet. That's a big deal at elementary, very, very important. And we can scroll down more and just get more and more information on uh, scientific creations over time. So I'll scroll down so that you can see that here. One other thing that I wanna highlight, and then we're gonna to get to the gallery, is I wanna highlight the ability to look for a specific person. And so if I click here, I actually have the ability to look for uh, scientists if I want to. Uh, and you can come in, here is uh, one on women and culture that specifically talks about female scientists. I'm gonna scroll down here because I love the stories that they have. If I take a look, there's actually one on uh, Curie. There's a story about um, science, scientists at NASA. It's, it's unlimited, the things that kids can get here. And I hope that what this can do is really start, start to spark that curiosity. I could spend days just looking at these, these stories. All right, so I'm gonna go back. Now, again, in the interest of time, we're not going to go through all of this, but I want to highlight right here. You have the ability now, uh, again, we're focusing on science. You have the ability to look for historical events over time. You also can look for historical figures, as we kind of touched on a little bit already. One of the things that I want that I don't want to run out of time for, so I'm going to come back up to the top so that we can see this. Actually, we'll go to the invention of the wheel. So if I click on this one, as you're discovering things in arts and culture, you're going to see the heart, which is right here, this little icon here. If you are logged into your Google account, which I am, you can tell in the upper right-hand corner, you have the ability to build a gallery. So Katie mentioned that creation piece, and that's what I love about this. So I'm gonna go back. I'm gonna go very quickly through the gallery piece of it, then we're gonna take questions and wrap it up.
So if I go to my favorites, and what that's going to do is anything that I have favorited, so for example, I favorited this, um, the uh, dinosaur in AR. So if I click on that, I do just have to show this to you because it's really cool. <laughs> it is an AR dinosaur. So as we grab them, now, as I mentioned, the uh, app, you know, you would be able to actually walk around the dinosaur and look at the dinosaur as though he's in your room. So total distraction in the middle of my quick, my quick session. These are things that I have favorited. And if I click on galleries here, what I can do is I can start to collect those favorites. And then if I want to distribute them to kids, I have the ability to do that. So this is a gallery that I created, not super scientific, but I do want to show the ability to do that. If I click on this particular gallery, these are things that I have brought in and collected for uh, my own personal use. If I want to share that out with kids, I can, again, through Google Classroom. But I'm going to click Edit. I have access to anything I've added to my favorites, I can add to the gallery. So don't just think about pushing out content to you. Think about kids coming in and creating a gallery to you, uh, for you. Maybe you're studying the moon. Maybe you're studying the landing on the moon. There are so many things in arts and culture that you could ask kids to, to collect content and then share that with you. So with that, I'm going to come back here. I'm going to go to arts and culture and show you one last thing right down here, and that is places. Any place that you might be studying in your science classroom will likely have some form of AR or VR available to it. It just continues to get better and better and better. And so if you look, and this little guy, let me scroll down here. Wait, hold on one second. Give me one second, I accidentally closed my example. If you see Pegman, which is the little yellow guy, you have the ability to visit these places using Pegman. And let me get here, oh, hold on, I'm losing them now. Give me just a second, sorry about that. I accidentally closed my example, here we go. Here he is. This little guy right here is called Pegman. Anything that you see Pegman uh, involved with, that means that you can virtually visit any of the topics. So the Great Barrier Reef, any of the science museums that you have found, there is a virtual field trip attached to it. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and ask um, Lisa if there have been questions about Google Arts and Culture and Science. The images are just so stunning, Tim. Aren't they? I, yeah, the, the new AR, if you haven't looked at those yet, definitely take a look at them. It's amazing. Just amazing. I forget who it was in the chat. Oh, it was Mr. Archie who was talking about the 360 videos for his seventh graders. Oh, nice. Yeah, I mean, you just get lost in there. And, and Amrit wanted to know um, if you can share your gallery with other teachers or have a shared gallery. And if so, can you show us how to do that? You definitely can. So let me just come back up. Um, and remember, we click on favorites to create our gallery. When you go to share the gallery, so this let's go to my sample right here. If you want to share it, you're going to go into the edit. So you're going to build the gallery first. Then you're going to go in. I'm going to click edit because I've already done that. This part right here is very, very important. You have to make your gallery public in order to let anybody else come into it. Once you make it public, then you can use the save, uh, the share feature here to share using the link. This is what you might give to your, your grade level colleagues or your content level colleagues. You could also then share it to kids using Classroom or you might get the link to put into an email. Also, if you just want the link to the gallery that you want to give to your colleagues, it will, you can see along the bottom, it, it copied it right to the clipboard for me. And then that's what you give to your colleagues or to your teaching partners. The important thing to remember, though, is that it has to be public. If you don't see that it's public, 
Nobody will be able to find it. And that goes for kids too. All right. Any questions about that? No. Um, Tom, one of our presenters, uh, Tom Malini just joined us and he was saying um, that you can add YouTube 360 videos to slide presentations. Ooh, let's do it. Yeah. Oh, Tom, is that in your session? Because then I won't do it. No, no, no. <laughs> we could, you know what? You could do it by the link. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense if it's a YouTube video. I hadn't tried that yet. Yeah. Um, that's, that's awesome. I'm wondering in the chat, Lisa, does anybody use, I would love to hear what specific 360 videos maybe they've used. There are so many of them. And I find in these sessions, this is where we start to kind of build that, that learning network. Mm -hmm. of people that are using the same type of features. Yeah, I'll see if anybody drops a link. Um, so a two-part question. Sure. So Mr. Archie wanted you to demonstrate how we create that gallery again. And then Amrit wanted to just make sure, like when you create that gallery, and I understand you have to make it public and that gives you the link. Can you add collaborators? Not in the way that you're probably thinking about Google Docs. So it's not it's not meant that way. No, it's it's not what you're thinking. You would you would need to build and share out, um, and then that would be about it. So you would you would share across to each other. So um, I do I am I going through the section again on how to do it? Is that what I missed that first one? Um, just how to create the gallery. Sure, Super sure. Fast. We have a couple of minutes. Oh, okay. So as I have been looking through arts and culture, which I hope you have been doing, I went through, let's actually, let's go all the way through this. So here we go. As I've been looking through arts and culture, um, and just in the interest of time, I'm going to click on one and not really find uh, um, a science example. So give me just a second. I'm gonna go quickly through this, okay? If you find items, so this particular item, there's 129, I'll go ahead and click here. When you see this, the heart right down here, anytime you see that, you can add it to your favorites. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on it. And now I'm gonna go up to my favorites, which are up here. From here, this is where you can build a gallery. I'm gonna click on gallery. And then right down here in the bottom right-hand corner is the plus sign it will pull up all of the things that you've already marked. These are all of the things I have added to my favorites, okay? Now from here then, I can select the things that I wanna put in my gallery. So I'm gonna put my dinosaur in there. I'm gonna put a couple images in there. Okay, and when I click continue, it takes you to the place now to give it a title. And I'll say, this is my new gallery. And what I like about this too, in the description, this is where you might tell students, find three items related to the lunar landing, find uh, some items related to the Great Barrier Reef, find some items related to um, vaccine uh, um, over time, discovery over time. You can put that in here so I'm going to just say put directions here. And then this is where you would make it public. And this is where you would complete your gallery. And then remember from here, oops, sorry about that. From here, I can share it. And then here's the link to share. Does that help? Is that what you're looking for? Yeah, no, that, that's perfect. Okay. It's just phenomenal how much the Google Arts and Culture has grown over the years. It really has, and I, I can stop sharing here. Um, it really has, and I think, you know, Arts and Culture used to be called uh, the Cultural Institute. Right, yeah. You know, and over time, they've just added and added and added, and it's just exciting. Every time I go in, there's something new. Um, I always have to book out a lot of time because I'll go in for one thing and end up looking at 50 things. Oh, yeah. Even watching you, like I didn't want to open it separately. I wanted to watch <laughs> you go through it. But I'm like, oh, but I want to go back to that. I want to go back to that. Yeah, it, there's so much there. There's absolutely. 
Oh, yes. And I love uh, Mr. Archie using yeah. making the connection to podcasting. You know, Katie would be proud of that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. She's watching on YouTube. So yeah. she'll the job. She has a chance. Tammy, thank you for taking on us on such an awesome tour. And um, I also wanted to give you props for your cute little cursor. Uh, I find it's it's big enough. I love the smiley face, but it's big enough that everybody can see it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I have a colleague where I work who um, I don't know how he did it. He told me, but I don't remember. He made his cursor um, his bitmoji. Oh, <gasps> so he like jumps all over the screen. It's a, he works in one Challenge of Challenge accepted. <laughs> thank you so much everybody thank you have a great day tammy thanks and let's see i can't get to tammy to remove her right there we go all right bye bye tammy so um before i bring in our next speaker uh, i just want to remind you i'm going to drop the link in the chat here um if you go to gsummit.link slash acer uh you'll be eligible to win some of the giveaways that we're giving away so a ticket to a boot camp or a, a summit uh with apps events we also um have explain everything coming up and they have 10 codes for us to give away to some lucky winners and our next speaker has uh, one book out that he's happy to give a copy away of and um, another one coming out shortly if it's not out already so um, our next speaker is Jesse Lubinsky and Jesse is going to be talking about um, using technology to improve math in the classroom I'd say Jesse's entire title but um, it's pretty lengthy these things. <laughs> <laughs> Jesse, um, are you gonna screen share anything with us that you'd like I me to I totally share? am, and uh, you know me, I have tons of resources. So Lisa, I shared the link with you. If you wouldn't mind sharing the link in the uh, YouTube chat, I'm gonna share yeah. my screen. So fair warning, I am tethered to my phone right now because the, our, our internet just went out. So I, I love when you get to show really bandwidth intensive things over your phone. We're really gonna put the test to this now, but I am gonna share my screen. So uh, Lisa, thank you so much. I just wanna say shout out to the presenters who have uh, already gone so far. So like right. we showed a quick show, which is like the one tool when I was in the math classroom, I wish I had. Uh, Katie shared podcasting, which uh, oh my God, Text Help sponsors our podcast, Partial Credit. So shout out to them. And then Tammy showed one of my absolute favorite tools, which is Google Arts and Culture. I was actually a little jealous uh, <laughs> when I saw it in the schedule. So uh, I'm going to share my screen. What I want to do is talk through some math tools that I totally love, but I want to do it through a little bit of a different lens. These are probably tools you would not have thought lended themselves uh, to math by default. So uh, the link, which Lisa is also putting in the chat, is bit.ly slash apps events virtual math. That will take you to this slide deck. Um, and I really just want to jump in by talking about a tool. So I, I, I can't remember if Tammy mentioned it or not, but we're both members of the Google Earth Education Experts team. And so um, I really want to start off by diving into Google Earth for a little bit to take us through some ways that you can use Google Earth in the math classroom. And you might not have thought uh, that you could because Earth, you wouldn't think necessarily lends itself to the math classroom more than others, but it really does in, a, in an amazingly powerful way. And I'll go through some examples of lessons that you could do at pretty much any grade level. Um, and so we are in Google Earth right now. And actually one of the things that you uh, may not have realized uh, with Google Earth, if you haven't jumped into the new Google Earth at any point um, in the recent past is, Google Earth is completely 3D. So when you are, and actually let me search, you know, I'm in New York right now, so I'll take you to uh, the Empire State Building really quickly. We'll just uh, go there. But Google Earth is designed not like that old Google Earth where it's that top-down satellite view, but now it is this fully immersive 3D environment that you can completely navigate from wherever you are. So even on my home device now, I mean, tethered to my phone, you can still see, I can see New York City in a completely 3D enhanced environment that actually lends itself perfectly to the math classroom. And here's why. You may not know it, but they've already, people have already, not just Google, but other Google education experts and people have already cultivated this amazing set of resources for you to be able to explore Earth in the math classroom. And 
over here in the left hand corner, you can see that there's a little captain's wheel that's called Voyager. If I were to click on Voyager, it would bring you to these already collected voyages or set of sets of locations that have already been kind of bookmarked. So think of the galleries that Tammy shared with us in, um, in arts and culture. In a way, they're kind of analogous to that, right? Because they've already been cultivated for specific themes. So if you take a look at the slide deck, um, I've actually, if you go to slide eight, have picked out a few of these voyages that directly lend themselves to um, the math classroom. So one that I'll, I'll start off by just showing really quickly, and I think it was there before. Um, I don't think I can actually search for it here. So uh, let's go to education. And oh, perfect. The, the, th the three that I have are right here. So notice how there's three, uh, one for triangular structures, one for the, uh, the geometry of sustainable architecture, and another one that's the geometry of castles. So for instance, if I want to, look, look how it even says, learn how angles, line of sight, and properties of circles can help uh, define the geometry of castles. So I'm gonna click on that one and notice how this was created by Media for Math. On the slide deck, I've actually linked to Media for Math in the ones they've created, they've actually created lesson plans for teachers that can show them, um, uh, show you how to do this in your classroom. So how to take someone through it now, the nice part is you may look at these voyages and actually say to yourself, oh, well, I have a, a very clear way that I could do this. So you're, you, you're more than welcome to do that yourself. But what's great about these voyages is notice in the lower right-hand corner, it actually um, says it has one, one out of five. That's because they picked out five locations that are ideal for studying this theme of uh, geometry uh, using castles. So you, you'll see that I can actually explore this location using a traditional 360 photo uh, once I've gone there. And there's links here, which will actually take you out to the media for math uh, uh, content, which will let you actually take a deeper look through those lessons. But if I click on the next location, it will actually, rather than have to navigate through Google Earth, it will take me to that next location in the voyage where I can continue uh, to study. And actually, oh, Lisa, do you know this location, uh, Mont St. Michael? I don't, but now I wanna go there. While it's loading, am I still there? Yep. Yeah. So this is actually um, a, a city where, uh, it, like basically the water uh, recedes and uh, raises and there's a wall around the entire city. So it's actually a really cool location, but it's another one of these locations that you can study uh, the geometry. So there's a few of those there within Google Earth that I'd love for you to take a look at. But I actually want, you know, I'm a big fan of getting students hands on in their learning. So what I want to do is actually take us to, um, you know, the, Lisa, the baseball season just ended. Um, the Yankees did not win. It was very sad. And I'm going to take us to Fenway Park, which uh, shout out to my partial credit podcast co-host, uh, Donnie Piercy, uh, Kentucky Teacher of the Year. So I wanna use Fenway Park as a place to show you a bunch of lessons that we could do with our students in the classroom at any grade level. So what I'm gonna do, again, remember, we're in full 3D right now, so I'm gonna click, uh, I'm gonna close the knowledge card here, and I'm actually gonna navigate, I'll do a little rotation here, and bring us to a fully top-down, I can click on the 3D button here to make it 3D or 2D. So I wanna to go to a 2D view of Fenway Park. I'm gonna zoom in and just kind of pivot us around using my mouse cursor. Perfect. So it's now centered on my screen. So one of the questions I can pose to my students is, if I'm in an elementary classroom is, I could say, you know what? Do you think it would be quicker for me to run around the bases? Or do you think it would be quicker for me to run from home plate to the green monster? Right, and this is a question I would ask my kids, what do they think? And they might think, you know what? It probably takes me longer to run to the wall. That's further away. Running around the bases would probably be pretty quick. Well, one of the cool things we're able to do using Google Earth, that you may not even realize that it's here, is if you look over on the left-hand side, you'll see that there's this measure distance and area tool. If I click on that, I can actually do a little exploration with my students. I can say, okay, well, starting at home plate, let's click. And let's go around the bases. 
And before I do that, I'm actually gonna convert to feet. So it's around. So I'm clicking around the bases. And that is 360 feet, right? And what's cool, this will come into play later. Once I clicked it, I cl actually clicked it. It should be 360, but it's 359. Not only did it close the shape, but it actually gave me the area as well, which will come into play later. So it was 360 feet for me to run around the bases. If I now zoom out a little bit and do that from home plate to the wall, it was around 309, 310 straight to the wall. So my students, by allowing them to use Google Earth and the measure tool, they could have just shown me it's actually quicker to run from home plate to the wall rather than run around the bases. But as we start to, and by the way, these lesson plans and examples are all in the slide deck. So every link, every resource that I'm sharing here, you can find that in the resources that Lisa shared in the um, chat. So as I go up in grade level though, the questions I'm asking my students as they study um, you know, math are going to obviously uh, become a little bit more um, challenging. So one area I might ask my student, uh, one question I'm, I might ask my students as I get to like the middle grades is, are certain ballparks better for hitters or pitchers and why? So I could have my students search for different baseball stadiums and use the measure tool to tell me, to, you know, I could say use the measure tool to prove your point. Why do you think a certain ballpark might be better for a hitter rather than a pitcher? And so what I could do is I could use the measure tool in Fenway Park, for instance. Uh, we just did that to, to go around the bases, but here I might use it and I might say, okay, you know what? I'm going to click around fair territory here. And I'm going to go around. And click here and then go down. Rough estimate. I can always grab this and move it. If I don't, if my clicking isn't perfect, so that's the nice part too. So it turns out that if I wanted to find the area, I now know in terms of square feet, how much square footage there is to cover in fair territory. If I were to do that same measurement in other ballparks, well now I know how much ground there is to cover for the people, for the players on the field. And so I might come to the conclusion, well, certain ballparks have more square footage and therefore there's more ground to cover for the fielders. So that might be a tougher place for, for pitchers and a better place for hitters. So things like that. Again, we're trying to push student thinking, but providing them with the tools to be able to do some exploration in the math classroom. Um, you know, sticking with one of my favorite topics, right? Pythagorean theorem, same idea. Now we're talking about something that's higher middle school, early high school. I might ask, you know what? So I have this green monster wall here. How far does a ball have to travel to clear the green monster? And so one thing I could do is I could say, okay, I'm gonna use the measure tool here. Let's see down the line. We already measured it, it was 310. So that's one of the legs of my right triangle. But the problem is how do I find the height, right? Because my lines are all in two dimensions and they're right here. Well, I'm gonna show you a cool thing. So let's remember that, that 310 number for now. One thing I can do is notice how I'm moving around the field. I don't know if you could see it, but in the lower right-hand corner of my screen where it says camera, and it gives kind of my um, longitude and latitude, all the way on the right-hand side, it says 41 centimeters. That's telling me how far above ground level I am where my cursor is. So if I put it to where the green monster is, Notice how it's telling me the green monster is about, you know, anywhere from, depends where I'm putting it because those are seats right there. So let's say around uh, maybe 10 meters high, right? There's my green monster, 10 meters. So now I can convert 10 meters to feet or leave it there's and, and do my measurement meters here. And now I have two legs of a right triangle. I can calculate the hypotenuse using the Pythagorean theorem, and that will give you the straight line distance from home plate to the green monster and what it would take to get over that wall. Now, for my high school teachers out there who were like, okay, that's cool, but how would I use this in like advanced trig? Well, if you look at the slide deck, you'll see I have a little lesson plan for 
using um, for using that in in the math classroom. Uh, there's a great article for launch angles. I can use the measure tool to find the distance and then use inverse trig functions to find the optimal launch angles for different areas of the ballpark. So again, you can use Google Earth for all different types of exploration there. I know I only have a few minutes left. Lisa, how much time do I have left? Can I do a time check with you? Uh, you have, let's say seven minutes. Okay, so I know what I wanna show because I have too much stuff, Lisa. I'm sure it doesn't surprise you. So what I wanna show is, um, okay, I lied. I'm gonna show two things really quickly because I like to challenge myself. So the first thing I wanna talk about, and you can find more information about it in, um, in the chat is very quickly, I'm going to QuickTime and I wanna share my screen. So if you're not already familiar with Google Expeditions, um, you will see that, okay. So one of the giveaways Lisa's gonna be doing later is, um, is of my book, Reality Bytes, uh, Innovative Learning Using Augmented and Virtual Reality. And so Expeditions is one way that we like to do VR using Google Cardboard. And so what I've done here is I've downloaded a Google Expedition call, uh, for Egypt. And I'm going to say, okay, cool. I want to view this. I would say view in VR, but because you're looking at my phone, I don't want to, uh, to go crazy here. And let's say we're studying the Great Pyramid. Well, I could have my students using, using their Google Cardboard. Uh, and Lisa, just making sure, are you seeing my, um, my screen here? Yeah, your okay. phone. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Perfect. Okay, great. So you're seeing my phone. So here's the, here's the pyramid. Now, we might be studying the pyramids in ancient Egypt, but now maybe I want to bring this into the math classroom and say, okay, well, how do we calculate the volume of this period? We know uh, this pyramid. We know the formula, but I'm not quite sure how we do it. So maybe I give them the measurement of this bus that's here, like, or have them look up what the you know the length of a bus is, and now maybe I use this as a way of having them estimate. Okay, well, given the length of that bus, about how many buses could I fit across this three, this image? Uh, Google Expeditions has an amazing AR tool where I can project it right in front of me. Maybe they use that as a supplement to try to figure that out. So Expeditions, you can connect, and there's so many Google Expeditions out there, and please look at the slide decks, learn more about Expeditions, but you can use Expeditions as a way of uh, an entry point for VR to be able to do um, to great math uh, explorations. But the last tool I want to show you is another tool to be able to do some really amazing stuff in um, VR, and that is CoSpaces. So CoSpaces is a great tool that can be leveraged to use uh, uh, AR and VR. We cover it in the book. Um, Lisa is also going to be giving away a copy of my upcoming book, uh, The Esports Education Playbook, Empowering Learners Through Inclusive Gaming. So we're uh, really excited to find out what you guys think of those. But CoSpace is a great tool where you can actually do um, some hands-on learning through virtual reality. So one great example, and again, the lesson plan is linked on how you would do this here, but I also have a link to the world, so you can actually explore this world for yourself, is to have students create a math museum. And so here I have an irrational numbers museum that was created in, in, uh, in CoSpaces. It's a very simple tool to be able to use. This can be used in a headset, but I'm just using it right now, right on my, on, my, on my book here. So notice I see some people here. A student created this world as a review. So welcome to the Museum of Irrational Numbers. Welcome to the proportion. <laughs> That's a creepy laugh that they put in there. So let's say, okay, welcome to the Irrational, houses, the irrational Numbers house. Come in and you'll be surprised. So I'm going to actually, just using my arrows, go into the Irrational Numbers house. Okay, so here I am, I'm looking around. Oh, go back out. Turn around. Let's see what we got here. Okay, so I'm in the irrational numbers house. Here's my friend, he says you can find images about irrational numbers. So students can create these structures and actually be able to put review images or other types of content for students for that can be explored. And uh, I can just click exit and it'll actually take me out to, I can go somewhere else. 
So this is a really neat way for students to be able to, and if you think about combining this with some type of coding lesson um, or you know interdisciplinary lesson where I can learn more about uh, the various tools there. So if I click on the number, it'll bring me into this room. And this is welcome to the Cordovan Proportions House. On the floor, you'll see the famous mosaics. And it's almost like a tour that they created. I'll show you one other one that I like that's a little bit more interactive. This one was actually created by the Cospace team themselves. Uh, so this is great. Again, if recreating or solving could be a challenge during a STEM or coding lesson, but it could also be a review tool for math. So if I were to take this and make it, I could always reuse it um, as a tool. So here's a maze. So solve the, I'm going to start playing. And so I'm going to manipulate my way through this maze. Again, this was uh, this is something that could be easily created by a student. And here, so I'm going to click. So here's a math problem. 7 times 3 minus 1 plus 2 plus 8 in parentheses. Uh, doing the math really quickly. PEMDAS, right? 2 plus 8 is 10. 7 times 3 is 21. So 21 minus 1, 20 plus 10, 30. And now that wall has disappeared, so I can now move forward. To get the basic idea, I think that is, I'm pretty much out of time. There's a ton of resources, though, that are there for you to be able to um, learn more about uh, how to use CoSpaces. I'm just happy to do this quick little introduction, so I'll stop sharing. And uh, Lisa, do you have any questions from the, from the crowd? Yeah, no, everybody's just talking about how they love the real world connections. Um, and helping make math make sense to students. Totally. I mean, it's that, it's that evil thing, right? Like, why do I have to learn this? I don't need to know this. <laughs> and I think as math educators, we tend to think about the tools that we need. Like, how do I get images into forms or equations or like the practical how I'm going to do this? But when you start to think about tools like arts and culture or Google Earth or expeditions, exactly. This is a way of taking, of providing real world application to the things we're learning. And what better time to do that than when we are in a remote learning environment and we can actually let our guard down a little bit. Some of our standardized testing requirements have gone away. Let's actually get in there and explore with our students and learn collaboratively. I appreciate your time and, and uh, what you presented, Jesse. Before we talk about your books, do you wanna share a little bit about your podcast? Uh, sure. So we do a podcast called Partial Credit with uh, my good friends Jeff Heil and Donnie Piercy. I'm a little bit sad. They're recording right now without me. It's the first episode that, that, that we're not on, but I had to be here for you guys. So, um, they couldn't wait 20 minutes? Do you know them? Of course they yeah. can't wait 20 minutes. They yeah. do things on their schedule, but it's okay. Uh, we had a guest, a really special guest this week, so we wanted to make sure they got a chance to come on when they could. But um, yeah, so love Partial Credit. Um, so the two books, so these were done with my Ready Learner One uh, teammates, Micah Shippey and uh, Christine Lyon Bailey, Reality Bites. You can learn more about co-spaces and ways to leverage uh, virtual and augmented reality in your classroom. A ton of science applications, Lisa, and I don't even know if you know this, the book is AR enabled. If you scan the, back, the QR code on the back cover of the book, you can actually interact with the experiences in the book. They're all science-based, it's great. Um, and then the eSports Education Playbook that's coming out. Uh, I co-authored that with Christine as well as Steve Isaacs and Chris Aviles, two New Jersey educators. And we're really excited. That book is coming out at the end of the month. And Lisa will be giving away a copy of each and letting me know so I can ship out a couple of signed copies. And thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Yeah, so speaking of which, I'm going to drop that link in the chat again for everyone. Or actually, uh, before we move on, I will put up the banner. So um, if you go to gsummit.link slash Acer, which many of you have already done, I see the replies coming in. You're eligible to receive. Um, Jesse, you're giving us uh, a copy of each book, right? A copy of each book. Super excited. So the Reality Bites one will go out immediately. As soon as the esports one is published at the end of the month, I'm going to ship that one right out. Awesome. Well, Jesse, thank you much so much for <laughs> for joining us today, as always, and we'll we'll catch up hopefully sometime this week. Awesome. And um, whoever your provider, whoever your provider is for your mobile network, like way to go, provider, because um, <laughs> you did all of that. All not for a I was totally stressed about it, but yeah, okay, I worked out, and uh, 
I'm I'm excited to to watch this later, the rest of it, because it's been so good so far. So thanks for putting this together. Awesome. Thanks, Jesse. All right. So uh, I'm going to bring on Rashawn Richards now from Explain Everything. And Rashawn, good morning or good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hi. How's it going? It's going great today. And thank you so much to you and to Explain Everything. Uh, we've been sharing the... Um, We've been sharing the code, uh, not the code, but the form to fill out. Uh, to, you're giving away uh, 10 codes for Explain Everything. I'm a big Explain Everything fan, so I'm super psyched about that. And um, are you ready to share your screen and everything, Rashawn? I think I've got everything ready to go. Oh, look, there it is. Awesome. Awesome. So, um, yeah, so uh, collaborative problem sets across distance. We're ready to learn with you. All right, super. Well, and, and good afternoon, everybody who's tuning in live and future people who may be tuning into the stream of this uh, at, a, at a different time. Um, I am going to share um, some ways to use Explain Everything in, in collaborative settings uh, and collaborative across distance and in many ways across time as well kind of settings. Um, if you're not familiar with Explain Everything, it is a, uh, it is a whiteboard, a, a, we call it a supercharged whiteboard. It, is, um, it started as an iOS app uh, almost 10 years ago, uh, but now is available on Android, uh, on Chromebook, and it runs great on Chromebooks that are able to run Android apps uh, natively, and especially the touchscreen. Chromebooks that that can install uh, stuff from the Google Play Store, uh, that's great. And then there's also a web version, which I'm also going to connect from um, during this this short presentation. Um, it, it started as kind of a, a an empty an empty canvas, and and that's typically what what you might start with. I'll, I'll just add a, an empty canvas here. Like this this is all explain everything is a blank a blank page and. Uh, you know, my background is in, is in teaching and, and in ed tech and, and in middle school math teaching. And, uh, you know, one of the d directions that um, informed how Explain Everything was built was thinking about how do we make it, uh, how do we create more pathways for students to demonstrate understanding, to, um, to show what they know in ways that traditional uh, assessment and checks for understanding uh, are often limited by. And it, it just so happened that the iPad the first touch your tablet started making um, an impact or, or, or being considered in school settings, you know, 10 ish years ago. Um, and through a, a helpful convergence of many things, uh, explain everything got created. Uh, I am one of the, the, the three original founders. And um, though I still, you know, my main gig these days is still uh, as a school administrator. Um, so there's a bunch of stuff that you can do. You might be noticing I'm kind of browsing uh, along within Explain Everything here, uh, but there's a bunch of authoring tools, which I'll try to use kind of in situation. I can import and export all kinds of formats. That's another thing that I'll be modeling in this particular use case. And another thing that's happening like right now, even in this live stream setting, uh, I'm using Explain Everything as kind of my live whiteboard and presentation space. So you know, if I really needed to draw a smiley face there, I could, and that is uh, what you all uh, are seeing. And then uh, it's got, you know, mobile and touch design as its primary element, uh, but it's a fully kind of cloud and every every platform um, uh, compatible and, and effective uh, tool. You know, people often ask, what what are people using Explain Everything for? And um, you know, when we first started, it was, let me try to find a good color that'll stand out against this background. This one will. Let me do a thinner pen. Um, most, it, it started around use, creating whiteboard uh, videos. And certainly teachers and, and instructors were using it to create instructional content. And certainly in this pandemic with, with so many people needing to find effective ways to, to teach across distance. It's something that people do. Um, but the, the, the genesis of, of the idea was far more about how can students use whiteboard videos as a way to demonstrate understanding 
while uh, of course teachers find it effective too. Um, this is what's happening right now. I'm kind of doing a, uh, a one-way presentation, uh, though it's going to kind of turn into this when I, when I open it up for, for people to join me on this canvas. But the, the use case or the, the, the usage of this tool that I'm gonna focus on is this, like how can you create uh, a whiteboard space, a, an interactive space that folks can come together uh, and, and collaborate on. And we're, and we're gonna try it too. Um, let me see what's on the next page, I've already forgotten. Oh yeah, it's blank. So it's a blank canvas, so I, I, I've got a different background going on here. So I, I wanna think about a situation where, you know, normally in, in my brick and mortar classroom, you know, I might start, you know, with some direct instruction um, and then I might have my students kind of first do some independent work. Uh, then I might have them work together uh, on a couple of problems and then maybe uh, we'll do some kind of group check for understanding, sharing work and so on before uh, exiting. So I'm thinking about this moment here and how difficult that is to do um, in a kind of very natural way or a, a way that doesn't feel um, like the tech gets in the way or the steps get in the way of people being able to uh, work together and think together. So let me just shrink these over. Oh, I thought those were gonna group together, they didn't. Um, so you can see everything that's on this canvas is like a independent movable uh, object. And it's also a fully like infinite canvas. So I can zoom way in and way out, but I'm just gonna move those little doodles over here. What I want to imagine is a setting where I've got all my curriculum planned. I've put a ton of work into the types of activities and experiences that I believe my students should do in order to be successful uh, in, in my class. So what I've done is, um, oh, let me make sure this is actually on here. Um, oh yeah, good. So I'm, I'm browsing into my files here and I, I created, um, just a, a, a problem set. It's super boring. I know this isn't like a great activity, uh, but you know, practice is important and, and thinking through steps and procedure and developing habits in mathematical work is an important thing. Um, and I'm going to import this document as separate slides. And what's happened here, this is kind of this long timeline of my project. Um, I've basically brought in two, two pages here. What I wanna be able to do is have a situation where I've got this PDF, but I want students wherever they are, maybe I'm using breakout rooms in whatever video conference platform I'm using, or maybe this is an asynchronous class, but I wanna be able to have it so that I can put small groups of students together and then have them work on things, whether they're speaking to each other and working on it live, or perhaps asynchronously um, in a similar way that you might with the Google doc, right? That you can both be in it together uh, but also kind of go work in and, and come back. And the, the, the opportunity here um, is that I can use like the, the naturalness and in many ways the messiness of whiteboarding as, as this kind of more dynamic, more live, more fluid space. Uh, it doesn't have to be as pretty or, or as polished in order to be able to show thinking. Now, I'm not sure how many people who are tuning in live um, are gonna be able to do this, but we can see, like usually, um, I, I think the first 20 people who try to join, um, it, it will let you in, but if, if, and not everybody may have a computer, but, or sorry, a device or, or multiple windows that they can, can use. But what I wanna model here is that uh, I already set this, this file up. So I've got my explain everything project and I've made it, right? I imported the PDF and I've made it so that I can invite people to it. And you can see it in this link uh, that I'm highlighting here. So if anybody were to go to explaineverything.com or launch um, the app on their, on their Chromebook or iPad or Android device and enter this code, it would let you uh, join in on the whiteboard. And so um, I've joined, oh yeah, go ahead, Lisa. You can't see the code. Oh, really? Is it cropped off? Let me type it in no, here. It's just, no, it's just super small. So yeah, if we can type it in the chat for folks, because I'm I'm all ready to join as well. Awesome. You're going to have to do some long division. Is that okay? Uh-huh. It's like I'm doing my taxes. M B E W N. Okay. So I'm going to drop that code 
in the chat for everyone and then use it um, myself. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So, so we'll 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 see what happens here. Um, I'm also so right now. Um, the way that I've got this collaborative space set up is so that um, I'm going to this scenario thing. So right now, even if people join, I'm kind of directing it and, and nobody else um, can edit, but I'm actually gonna change this now to open collaboration. Um, and now, you know, if, if people who are joining come over to slide six, um, you can actually work on um, one of these problems here and maybe um, Lisa or somebody else, if you want to go over to slide seven and do some multi-step uh, solving for, for uh, a variable, you can go back. Um, if you're working off a trackpad, it's often a little clumsy to try to ink, uh, but also um, something to try. So I could see yeah, five people. Uh, oh, I guess, yeah, it is super small, but up here, it tells me how many people have joined in this space. So maybe I'll do this. I'm going to go back to making it so that you're forced to watch what I'm doing. Sorry, everyone and you're gonna be following me. Uh, and your toolbars might've gone away just now uh, if you had it open. But let's talk about division. So folks, we're gonna, uh, you know what? I like to do partial quotients when I'm solving division. So um, instead of like, you know, trying to do the whole this or that algorithm, maybe we'll, we'll think about this. Like how many 20s are in 50,000? Well, I know there's at least a uh, thousand, right? So. Oh, actually, that should be over there. Look, I've already forgotten. Look, I'm erasing. You can see that. Um, so 1,000, 20 times 1,000 is 20,000, uh, 36. Some of you might be like, what is this weird new math? Um, but this is how I like to do um, long division quickly. OK, I need more room. So you can see me solving through. OK, so now it's going to be 500, right? So that should be 10,000. Uh, 6106, and then maybe, um, oh, however many, 30, no, 300, 6,000, 106, and then 500, remainder 6, and 620. So however many did I have here? 1, 2, 2,500, 2,800, and 5, with the remainder of 6 twentieths or 0.30. So, Imagine I was doing a better job of explaining this kind of really boring division problem. Now I might say like, hey, um, oh, somebody signed in here. Sorry to put your, your, your name up there, but I'm going to put, um, if Heather has the, the power and is interested, um, oh, Heather, Heather is gone. Let me see. Um, I'm going to make somebody else here. Um, somebody randomly just got the power uh, to uh, edit this. And um, if you wanted to even attempt to try to, <laughs> to write on this, you could. Um, we'll see what happens. And if not, maybe I'll make my alternate version of myself uh, the person. But I want to give it just a few seconds to see if that happens. Oh, no. OK, so watch this. Sorry. Sorry. So watch this. I'm going to make. Um, so now I'm going over to my laptop um, over here. And I might be like, I don't know how to do any of this. And I'm just going to draw a big question mark. So that's, this is like a, um, a space where I'm now kind of trying to overly control who's editing at once. But I could also set it so that now everybody can kind of freely um, work, write, manipulate, uh, and go to town on the space. And that, that kind of is the free form setting that might work well if I'm trying to help people um, work together in a messy space um, like this. So all I had to do was have the content I needed, an existing PDF, bring it in to explain everything, and generate a link over here. And then all of a sudden, I can now share that with my students. Um, I could create multiple versions of these if I wanted uh, specific sets. Or I could have a whole bunch of problems staged across multiple slides. And I could say, hey, Lisa and Susie, you work on slide six. Hey, you know, Freddie and Frank, you work on slide eight. And I can, you know, bring in those kinds of general like classroom management uh, practices um, in, in working within this shared space. Rashad, yeah. question for you. 
a lot of us, you know, have signed in, but we still show up as explainer rather than our name. Oh, I wonder why that is. So even when you join, I think if you're not logged in with an explain everything account, um, it, it'll, it just shows up as this kind of uh, default name. But if you'd signed up for a free account, like, or sign in with Google, then, right. th then it would show that. But if something, if you signed in mid flight or something, it could also, um, may maybe it just hasn't reconciled on, on my screen. Um, but what this also shows is that uh, you all don't need to have an account in order to be a live participant here. Like I am, I have an account, right? Well, for a lot of reasons, um, but I can invite anybody to join and be able to work together on this, even if you don't have an account, but I have to kind of be here. Um, whereas if I give everybody uh, an account, which many schools do, then there's a little bit more flexibility to be able to create uh, and like host these types of things um, and, and, and invite whomever. So I'm certain that the, the five explainers here um, either are not logged in or may not even have explain everything accounts, um, but you're still able to like enter into this space uh, and work together. Um, and you know, I'm still the host. And if you noticed it, oh no, let me, I'm gonna become host. Um, I'm back to being the host. So even in this space, so a lot of you obviously are following the screen share, but if you were watching on your device, um, I'm, you're, you're kind of following along with me. So even if we'd kill, if I'd stopped sharing my screen to you, Lisa, the eight people who are connected, who've got it open in their browser or on their device, you would still be following me um, because you would still be able to see um, this whiteboard space um, without me even needing to stream it through uh, what's going on here. Um, and so, you know, here's another example. I might model. Oh, sorry, look, somebody got it. Nice job. Whoever, whoever, whoever's putting in a text box there. Um, super. Check. Check plus. Um, another thing that, that you can do if you, if, you, if you thought about other content types, here's an opportunity where if a student needed to like write it out and sh you know, show their work on a piece of paper, they could do that and then they could take a photograph of it and, and drop it in here. Um, I had a plan to do it. Let me find a piece of scrap paper and let me, uh, I'm gonna solve this bottom one here. Six X equals uh, minus seven equals 18 plus two X. I'm doing this quickly. Oh, I'll do it like a bad student who's not showing all their work. X equals six point. So I may not have, um, you know, oops. I may not be um, able to or wanting to, like I might prefer to show my work um, writing on paper, but like, oh, where is it? Oh no. So now like I, I might just be able to drop that in here. And now that might be a way to like, just add to this, this, like I said, messy space and have people to be able to uh, contribute and, and show their work and, and just have um, just have more flexibility and fluidity in getting what's in here um, into a space that, that other people can comment on and, and share. Let me see. I'm just going to check the chat to see if there's any questions that I can answer. Uh, otherwise, I can go deeper. Do I use roots? Yeah, they were just asking about touch pads and, and things like that. I mean, I know it's so much easier um, with an iPad or a touch screen on a Chromebook. What do you do for schools that are one-to-one -one Chromebooks with no touch screens, or maybe they're MacBook Airs or something like that? So I think they're like they're like really free form, like collaborative inking. I mean, it's it's just it makes more sense on a touch screen device, and that's why I was even modeling this example, and it's something I often talk to schools about is. Um, you know, the camera on your device is one of the most powerful <laughs> tools for, for demonstrating and showing work. And so you could still use this collaborative whiteboard space and just bring in uh, uh, photographs or images of, of work as a place to like, um, to, to bring it together. 
many folks will, um, you know, you can, with a trackpad, you can use a pointer uh, with, with relative ease. You can draw shapes, uh, especially like an arrow uh, with a little bit more ease. Um, but, and then you can use text box as another way um, to communicate. And so that's what generally um, helps folks who are trying to figure out ways to have good natural inking on non touchscreen devices. Um, obviously they have those like external pads and like tablets and stuff like that, but I often find them to be a little bit disorienting to use because you're, you're writing down here, but what's happening is uh, showing up on the screen. Uh, but that's like, that's a perf personal preference thing. So one, one of the workflows, um, if, if you wanted to think about it this way, so first you need your document, right? Or whatever existing content that you might want students to work on. And then you wanna import it into explain everything so that, um, so that it's on the canvas, which is what I did with that problem set. And then you want to share it which it generates a link. Uh, and then you wanna post that link on wherever it is uh, that you post things, whether it's on your LMS, whether it's in a, a live space, um, if you've got it like a, a chat channel or something like that. Um, and if you thought like, all right, but I wanna have multiple, multiple like kind of forked versions, you know, you, you would have this kind of re re rinse and repeat uh, process. And what you would end up doing is just, generating multiple links that would all, you know, you would share there. So I know for, uh, you know, some universities with who are using explain everything where they'll have, you know, a uh, hundred people in, in a class and they need to have, you know, 30 versions of a problem set. Oh, somebody's enjoying the zoom tool. That is excellent. Um, that, uh, cause we're using, I think we're in the free form collaboration right now. Um, so some Sorry, people, me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're fine. <laughs> um, I, I can, I can, I can, uh, I, I can change that back. I'm, I'm walking it down. So just FYI for the seven folks who are connected right now, um, even though I'm like directing it, you should have the option to like unfollow. So if there was something like on a previous slide that you wanted to go back to, like you, you can actually um, not follow that again, not from the live stream, but from, from, um, from your own device. And, and that is something else, like another element that people have found um, helpful in these kind of um, crazy collaborative settings that, that, that exist now. Um, even if we weren't using, you know, Lisa, you and I, for the, this, um, the, 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 the live stream platform, if, you, if, we were, if I disconnected completely from this, um, there is the option for voice chat uh, within here. So the seven of us, uh, seven of you all, or six other folks, um, you would be able to hear what I was saying and also see what I was writing. And I could actually invite you also to, to speak back. So we could, we could have this collaborative visual on the whiteboard and auditory spoken experience, totally standalone and separate from whatever voice or video conference. But again, just remember it's, it's 20 people, uh, which is like the, the, the number. And I would say for it to be like truly like intimate and collaborative, I don't know, six to eight is like the best number of, of people. Otherwise, it's, it's more like cooperative than collaborative. Like people are in the same space, but you're actually not functionally doing anything together. You might as well be using like a one directional presentation tool of, uh, or give everybody their own space to work on. So that's amazing. So you wouldn't even need to be in a Zoom or a Google Meet or whatever you're using and still be able to communicate with the students in your class. Correct. The only thing that you would be missing is the video. We, we, we haven't gone that far yet. <laughs> <laughs> is it on the roadmap? <laughs> Everything's on the roadmap. Yeah. I mean, it's the, like, it's, it, it adds, you know, from even, I mean, this is like to think about like, uh, you know, network and bandwidth and stuff like that when you don't include video in the equation, like you can do quite a lot with audio. And then the way our, the whiteboarding works, it's not a screen share. Like it's, it's just sending data of like strokes and position. So it ends up being like way more lightweight than like doing a true screen share. So even folks who are just on LTE or in areas with not so great bandwidth, uh, it ends up being a pretty helpful um, 
way to have these collaborative experiences as opposed to like, oh, the default is video. And then when video is bad, well, guess what? I have to turn off my video or I have to, you know, only connect via phone. And then that participant isn't having a great experience, even though everybody else or the person who's running it has set the default like, oh no, but this is how I'm running it. Uh, mm -hmm. And it becomes very inequitable um, and, and, just, and just not good. Rishan, um, we've, we've come to the end of our time, but uh, you know, you've been so generous as to give us 10 codes to give away. Can you talk a little bit about the free version of Explain Everything versus the paid version? Yeah, so this often comes up as questions. Let me try to explain it. So one, um, the free version that if you, if you go to um, uh, the, uh, the App Store, the Google Play Store, or just via the web, um, it gives you um, access. I think the limitations are on the, the time of your record if you're using it for whiteboard videos um, and, and the number of projects um, that you can create uh, before you have to kind of like clean up. And there might be a limitation uh, on storage space. Uh, and so most of the limitations are really based on like it's expensive to be able to um, do some of these cloud based things. Um, though I believe you can get a trial of the, the kind of quote, premium version where these things are uncapped. Um, so you can see like what you need. In many cases, like often it's the teacher who can benefit most from like the full account. And then the students for most places, like it's good enough to be on the free um, uh, version. So again, it's mostly just about like capacity um, as opposed to features uh, necessarily. And, you know, some people, if you're like an old school, uh, I, if you've had an iPad for a long time, um, there is like still like a legacy product called Explain EDU, which is just the whiteboard and the recording and, and none of the collaborative stuff. But that that's still there. But I know that it's um, it, it can cause confusion. But the codes that folks got, I think there's ten of them, which is essentially a one year uh, subscription um, to Explain Everything uh, with with you know with, with no limitations essentially. Well, no limitations compared to somebody who bought, bought a subscription. Yeah, well, we we appreciate that, and like Mr. Archie in the chat's just saying, you know, he's so impressed by how intuitive it is. Um, and Eunice is asking, um, we can can we export the screen as a PNG or JPEG? But I think you can also do PDF too, right? Everything, yeah. So this is going to be a little warning message since we're collaborating, but we're, since we're at the end, it's fine. I'm clicking this export button, um, and so you all are probably I don't know. I may have just kicked you all out of that because. Um, it's okay. <laughs> so um, Eunice, you can see here, if I if I made a video, I could export it as a video. Lisa just pointed out, I can export it as a document. I can save as an image and it might be all of the slides or I could just choose like, you know what, just that one. Um, and then I can choose where I want it to go. So, you know, uh, it's, the tool has always been meant to sit in the middle of people's workflows, though you can certainly use it end to end. But if you've already got your systems for this or that, like we really hope that like it fits in and you're able to, um, you know, j just find a place where it helps like accelerate your 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 intended goals. Awesome, thanks, Rashan. I appreciate you taking the time. I saw your your cute little daughter back there <laughs> before you joined the live stream, <laughs> and you know, I I've, <laughs> I want to make sure you have the rest of the day with your family. <laughs> All but, right. Thank you so much. And, and I'm sure you're going to hear from 10 very happy people. Super. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks for the opportunity. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Uh, so next I'm going to be adding uh, Tom Mullaney. Now, um, I just wanted to mention again that ACER is our premier sponsor. Uh, they sponsor all of our summits and all of our virtual summits. Apps Events is going to be hosting, I think it's every uh, it's every month in 2021, a, uh, a free virtual summit just like this. And we're deciding on all different themes. So it's something to think about planning to spend some weekend mornings with us. Uh, there's a whole range of Chromebooks that Acer offers from sizes, you know, the traditional 11 inch Chromebooks up to 15 inches. And <coughs> excuse me, our next presentation is going to be with Tom. I'm going to go ahead and add him now. Hi, Tom. Hi, Lisa. Good morning, Tom. Oh, actually, good afternoon. I've been sitting here a while, so I've kind of lost track of time. Um, but uh, Tom's going to be talking about visualizing your data. So you're going to be talking about Data Studio. 
Yes. Uh, well, I'm going to talk about uh, just we're going to start with Google Sheets and how we can use what we make in Google Sheets across other G Suite or now it's being rebranded Google Workspace apps. We'll talk a little bit about Data GIF Maker and then Data Studio. So this will be a quick overview, a little crash course. Uh, this but awesome. be good. Thank you so much. All right. Well, let's get started. And here, and Lisa, I sent you the bit.ly, but I'll put a little bit.ly to my brief slide deck. It's bit.ly slash data dash workspace. Um, and so I have added it to the, um, the stream on YouTube now as well. Okay. Awesome. All right. So this, we'll just talk about you have data and you want to visualize it and you're using G Suite. What all can you do? Okay. So let's just talk about the conventional chart, right? The chart that you would do uh, per usual. And I'm going to go into Google Sheets and let's let's delete that. Pretend you didn't see that. And let's delete that as well. All right. So right now there is, well, I guess there's some, you know, there's something going on uh, in our world that might involve data and I'll delete that as well. And what that would be, you know, obviously we're talking about the presidential election. So let me just make a couple of quick charts real quick. All right. So I make a little chart here. I use my chart icon, insert chart. Okay, great. And I have a pie chart for, uh, this is for Pennsylvania votes yesterday at 2.16 PM. Okay. We'll do that as a pie chart. And then on the customize menu, which is really nice, uh, we will do a, we'll do under, uh, we'll, under chart style. I like doing a little 3D. I'm just going to quickly go and under uh, slice label, we're going to go to value. And once we do that, let's also just make this font size a lot bigger because, you know, yeah, we want it to stand out. Okay. So there we go. All right. So there we got votes. We could do, we could do a few other things, but I won't do that just yet. From there, I'll go into, this is where yesterday, just pretend that this is yesterday at 2.16 PM East Coast time. This is where the electoral vote stood. And I will again, go make a chart. And this time I don't want a, a, a pie chart. I want a, a bar chart. So let's do this one. Oh yes, 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 yes. This is gonna be very nice, right? Okay. And we're gonna click on customize. And let's just do a few things real quick. Again, I love this little 3D. I think that's really nice. Uh, let's put that away. Chart axis and titles. You can change the title. Electro Nobody's titling their thing. Electoral college votes versus candidate. That's what Google Sheets is just doing real quick. Uh, under series, let's do a couple of things here. Uh, let's change. Uh, okay, I think that's good. And... Uh, hold on. Uh, I, I want to change the Trump one real quick to red. And I don't know that I'm finding that real quick, but I want to make sure I do. Electoral college votes. Oh, format data point. Sorry. There it is. And we're going to choose Trump and we're going to make him, uh, red because otherwise there's not much contrast. All right, great. That's all we're going to do for now. And I want to just show you that real quick, you can do this across your G Suite app. So here in, in I'm in Docs, we just do insert, we do insert chart, but we're going to do it from Sheets. And I go here and it's going to show me that I have two charts. So there, I'll just put that one in there. And I can link it to my spreadsheet and unlink it and open the source, do all that cool stuff. Let's do that in slides and drawings again, real quick. So insert chart and from sheets. And we go there and we'll go there. And lastly, we'll do it in drawings. Actually not lastly, one more insert chart. And we will go from sheets and there, great. And then the other thing we can do is Google Sites. So if you have data, your data can live and be really nice looking on Google Sites. So real quick, at the very bottom of the insert menu, you have to go all the way down. I don't know. I don't know if that's the lead. I don't know, but they put it all the way at the bottom. We're going to do charts. And once we do that, we are going to click that. And it's giving me the two choices. And you know what? I'm going to do both. Can I do both? No, we'll do one at a time. Uh, so we'll put that one there. And then let's do the same under charts. We're going to add one more. 
we'll add them both. Now, we all know, or maybe you don't know, maybe you've been watching this all morning, uh, that we've had some updates. So let me go update my data, okay? So under, let's get that out of there. Under the Electoral College, there has been, I think only for Biden, but let's see, 253 is now 273. So I had to change that. And remember, my vote numbers were for uh, Pennsylvania. So I care about Pennsylvania here. So I got to change that. Let's move that over. And Pennsylvania is here. And so Biden now has this many. And Trump now has how many? This many. Okay, so now we have uh, as many here as we have. Okay, great. So what we need to do now um, is we need to up see if this stuff updates. So let's go into our uh, slides and look at that. There's an update button. And if I update, watch this. It's, I feel like I'm on CNN right now. Look at this. Oh, it. I've just updated. All right, let's do it in uh, drawings. In drawings, I click update, boom. Uh, in docs, I click update. Oh, I kept doing the pie chart. I like uh, the, the electoral college vote was a little bit more dramatic. Let's go to our sites. And in sites, there's no real update to do. You just go and you hit present or preview. And there it is. And I love the hoverability. I love when you hover over, you get a little thing. It looks real nice. Uh, love that. And then here you get, oh, I hover over, it says 273 here, I hover over, it says 213. Uh, really, really nice stuff. All right, so let's play this out a little bit with another tool that we can use. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of Data GIF Maker, uh, but it's this really cool tool. It's from the people at Google News Lab. So Google News has a news lab where they do, much like a lot of the experimental things like auto draw that you may be familiar with from Google. And they have these animated GIFs and I've made them. Now they're perfect for studying the electoral college. I mean, and by the way, let me just put this uh, a little bit lower because obviously then you won't see it. Uh, they've, it's really nice for small sets of data. So if you have, you know, one, two, or excuse me, two, three, four sets of data, uh, data points, it's really, really nice. So we have data, uh, gifmaker.withgoogle.com, two to four data points. And it's a really nice thing. And on my slides, I have a little blog post where I talk about doing some things with it. Uh, here are some examples of electoral college votes. You have to go, I think it's 1836 is the only time more than four candidates received electoral college votes. A little trivia. So every presidential election other than 1836 will work for this fine. And I just love, especially the story that plays out here on um, on, the, on the electoral college vote here, because it's like you see it and then it goes. Let's let's demo that real quick. So I'm going to do. Uh, we have our data for electoral college vote right now. It's 273 to 213. So let's make a, a GIF real quick. It's called racetrack. The other ones are called rectangle and circles. Circles is really nice for when there's a big difference in the data because you get that lollipop that's so much bigger than the smaller ones. I go here and let's make our colors. The color scheme's a little bit limited. Uh, so I'll make pink. There's no real bright red. And we'll go with that. I ah, will go with this blue for Biden. So here's Biden. Here's Trump. And we're at 273 to, oh, not 27, 273. Oh, it's actually making me do a number between one and oh, because I'm set to percentage. I'm sorry. So I set it to percentage and we want to be at number. So here, instead of 27, we're going to be at 273 and here we'll be at 213. And then we can just uh, preview this and you see here they go, they're running, they're running and oh, Biden goes ahead, right? So, and you give it a title and whatnot. I like to take these and pull them, you know, save them, throw them in Google Slides, and you can add 
imagery to it. You know, I could add a picture of Trump, a picture of Biden, really make it like CNN a little bit, right? Okay. So that's uh, Data GIF Maker. Uh, it looks like I have a little bit more than seven minutes. And I don't, Lisa, I don't see you. I don't know. But uh, hopefully I'll, oh, there you are. Yep, I'm, no, I'm watching. I just figured, you know, you didn't oh. need to see me on the screen. But no, take take your time. You're fine. You're fine. Oh, I'm so sorry, Lisa. I'm sitting here like, oh, no, I guess I'm, okay. <laughs> All right. Good to see you, Lisa. Anyway, I'm going to talk now. And this is an what we're doing with Google Sheets and their charts and Data GIF Maker, you can you can go in there and play and be an expert in five, 10 minutes, really quick, real simple and easy. Your kids can do this, really nice stuff. And I love that it lives and it, and it can be updated. Data, uh, Google Data Studio is a, it is, it's crazy. It is a professional level tool. There are people who use this to, you know, give their bosses reports on how their YouTube advertising campaign or their Google AdSense campaign are, are going. This is a crazy advanced tool. At the same time, I know a lot of math and science teachers are such data. They just love data and they want to present it and showcase it and do things with it. And this is the tool. Wow, it is so good. I'm going to give you the briefest of intros to this tool. And, and I have on my slides, I have some links where you can learn some more. Um, it, it says here, a uh, blank report. Everyone, if you ever look this up on YouTube, everyone on YouTube refers to the, the files as dashboards. Uh, it's, I like to say it's like a blend of drawings and sheets, although honestly, it's, it's more powerful than drawings and sheets combined. It really is. So if I click on new report, And let me just put my uh, slides off to the side because I put a little uh, process that I put on slide nine that you can use yourself. I'm going to use that as my like teacher's edition textbook. Uh, and let's get back into Data Studio. And it's going to ask for a connector. And so for now, there are like the professional level stuff here is crazy. YouTube analytics, all this stuff. But what we care about is Google Sheets. Let's just use Google Sheets and you it will choose here. And so I have this one sh uh, sheet that has a lot of different data, but I'm going to use the 2016 election popular vote. Let's use that. And I click add. And I'll click add to report. And please, uh, one, forgive me, I haven't been titling my G Suite files in the interest of time. So pr pr forgive my bad form there. It gives you at first, it gives you this table, which is completely worthless. My suggestion to you is just delete it right away. So just we're just going to delete it. Boom. Now we have nothing. All right. What are we going to do? Well, we're going to do we're going to first do a theme. So at the bottom, here are some default themes, but we can actually extract a theme from an image. So if you have, you know, if you're doing something for your school, you could use your school's logo. If there's an image, if there's an image that speaks to your content for like a lab report or something like that. So let me extract that theme from image. I'll upload uh, from the computer. And I'm actually, I, I wanted to use our little flyer for today, that that image, it's really nice. Uh, it doesn't have enough red in it though. So I'm just gonna go with the Apps Events logo. And what it will do is it will give me these three options based on that. And so I'll take this one here, it looks really nice. Okay, we'll do that. And then I can actually add an image, insert. There's the insert menu. Think about the insert menu in slides or, do or drawings or docs. The insert menu here is crazy. You can put in shapes and text and all sorts of stuff. Um, but we'll just do an image real quick. And I will do today's, oh, I'll click that. And I will put in select the file. And I'll put in our lovely uh, little advertisement image for today's session, really nicely done. There it is. Okay. And then let's actually get to the data. So let's uh, add data, uh, insert and we'll do a table. And again, I have to draw it out. And so again, right now, this isn't much. It has a, a little bit of an artistic theme from, uh, from, that, from the image that we gave it, but we'll do a style. Uh, oh, first thing, we're gonna click and drag what we want. So record count is meaningless, right? And this column here is meaningless too. We'll, don't worry, we'll get rid of them. So we want votes, that's what we care about. So we actually click and drag and now the votes are there. Okay, the other thing we can do is here under record count, under metric, we can remove that. 
All right, let me just tighten that up a little bit. And then under style, I can do a few things here that are a lot of fun. Um, one thing I can do is row numbers. Let's get rid of that. And the other thing I can do is I can change at the very bottom background and color. I can do a few things, but I'll add a border a shadow. And here I can give a little bit of an edge. Well, let's give a border. So we'll do border. I have my theme colors. So here I'll do this. I'll do this red. What the heck? And I'll do and I'll let's do that border weight. Let's make that nice and big. And then I'll give it a little bit of a border radius edge to it. And so now you see it's got this little edge to it. Should have that shadow too. Thought I dropped a shadow. Show header, wrap text. Uh, we'll get rid of the pagination. You don't need that. Um, add border shadow. It should be there. When I click on view, you see here there's a view. And yeah, there's a little shadow. Um, by the way, I can hyperlink that image. And I'll do one last thing. Lisa, I know I'm running a little short on time. Uh, one last thing if I go to edit. Well, yeah. Tom, we take two or three oh, more okay. minutes. It's fine. Let's add, let's actually add a chart then. So I'll add the chart and we'll do the pie chart. Uh, and I have to click and circle to do it. I click here, I can change my dimension value. So let's do it how we would typically do it in the United States. So blue for the Democrat. Uh, red for the Republican, and I'm doing them all for my theme. Uh, Jill Stein was green, so we'll make her green. And Gary, there's not a real libertarian color, so I'll just say yellow because it's a nice contrast. And oh, look, it's like the four Google, Google colors. And I'll click close. And so now that's a little bit nicer. And I can change a few things, including if I don't want percentage, although percentage is actually probably what you want there, but you can make the value. So let's just do here, I'll do the percentage again. And we can make that text nice and uh, bigger. Uh, where is that text? I had it. Uh, we'll add our border shadow while we're down here. Oh, here under auto. Uh, you want to make them nice and big. And I now I've made it so big I have to expand this. And maybe not 84. There we go. Under 44, it gets there. Um, we can also do a little donut hole, which is fun. There's so many things you can do. And, you you know, like I said, from an artistic standpoint and a data input standpoint, there's so many things. On slide eight, I have put some resources that you can use to learn a little bit more. Uh, but with that, I guess I'll end my session and, and ask if any questions have, uh, if there's anything in the chat that we want to address. Uh, uh, actually, uh, no, we don't have, but, but I have a question okay. for you, Tom. So, you know, Data Studio is something that I've been wanting to explore and I just, you know, haven't made the time to do it and I really should. Um, is it part of G Suite for Education? Does it come with it? So here's, you may have to ask your, your Google administrator to enable it. I've seen some districts where it's turned on, some where it's turned off. It's usually on. And, and unfortunately, neither neither um, GIF Maker nor Data Studio live in the apps launcher, the tic-tac-toe or waffle. I wish they did, but they don't. I can't add them. Uh, so it's it's literally the website. It's datastudio.google.com. And that's where you go and grab that. Uh, why that is, I'm not exactly sure, but uh, that's but this is a real product that people People use this a lot. Um, they typically do it with Google AdSense and to generate reports from that. But it's talking about having your students do a real world thing for sure. I do absolutely, you know, if we revisit what you were showing in the beginning, how you could um, embed something like from a spreadsheet into drawings. I've been doing that. I've been making entering my data in spreadsheets and then I put it into a Google Doc and it's a, just a pretty table in Google Docs, but I actually edited it in the spreadsheet and that update feature um, link. Yeah, that's the one. That's just been a game changer for me. Yeah, you do anything and you get, now in Sites, you don't even get it. Sites doesn't give you the opportunity to not update it. Sites is just gonna auto automatically update it, but in Docs and Sheets and um, Drawings, it will put the little refresh icon and then you update it. 
Yeah, it's just fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing with us this morning. You're very welcome. And Lisa, thank you for assembling this great team of people, so many people to learn from. Much appreciated. Really cool thing you're doing. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you. And thanks to Apps Events and Acer for hosting, right? <laughs> agreed. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and add uh, my presentation. I actually get to present now instead of uh, be a participant for a little while. And thanks, Tom. I'm going to go ahead up oh, and he removed himself from the stream. So our next session together is going to it's the next to last of the conference. Um, our next session together is going to be five ways to keep your science students engaged and on task. Um, and I'm going to drop a link in the chat, but if you go to edtechwithlisa.com, uh, that's my website, and I'm also at edtechwithlisa on Twitter, you will find this slide deck because I would love for you to be able to follow along if, if you're watching live. And if you're not watching live, if you're watching the archive of this, um, that's totally fine. This presentation will be there and you can actually run through it with me. So we're gonna be talking about Google Keep and um, uh, basically with Google Keep, you can create, you can share, you can collaborate, you can organize. Um, and uh, the Google Keep Notes will go with you wherever you go. So, you know, I've got my cell phone here, I've got my Chromebook in front of me, I can do it on my iPad, uh, anywhere that I wanna do it. And it's a little bit different from a mobile browser um, or an app on a, on a mobile browser than it is uh, on the web-based version, but um, you can really accomplish all the same things. And then where can you get it? So you can go to keep.google.com on your browser. It's a Chrome extension that you can install. It's an Android <coughs> app for your phone or if you have an Android-enabled Chromebook. And of course, the Apple Store for your iPad or your iPhone. Now, I will just make a note that it is currently a Chrome app that you can install, but that is going to be discontinued as of February 2021, as more and more Chromebooks um, are Android enabled. So <clears throat> why should you use Google Keep? And specifically, why should you use it in your science classroom and even your math classroom? Well, it's a great way to capture thoughts um, anytime you're going because I'm going to show you how to add those thoughts by voice, um, add checklists. There's so many different things that you can put in a keep note. And actually today, all the links that I've been dropping into our chat have all been coming from a keep note that I created so that I had everything organized. I used to put things in a draft email, um, but now I just put them in a keep note and it's so much easier to keep yourself organized. You can also set reminders on notes so that they pop up um, either when you arrive at a geolocation or at a specific time. And you can share your notes with other people, which we're going to talk about with regards to like science experiments and things like that. And then what can you keep? Well, you can keep a voice note, you can keep a checklist, you can keep an image, you can keep an image with notes attached to it. There's so many different things that we can keep. So five ways. Way number one, the first way that we're going to talk about using Keep to keep your students engaged and on task is by documenting experiments. So if we think about it, uh, whether it's a Chromebook that you're using in the classroom or at home, if the students are learning remotely, um, you can use your device to take a picture and upload that picture in Google Keep. So we're going to preview just what we're going to be working on. We're going to go into Google Keep. We're going to get an image that we've taken, or I have one for you to download, um, off of our device. And then we're going to go add some notes to that image. So if we go back a slide and we think about, you know, just a simple experiment that some elementary students might do at home, what makes the egg float, what makes the egg sink, okay, we've all done an experiment like that. They would take it a, a picture and they would give step-by-step -step directions on their process through their science experiment. So first get two plastic cups, then fill each cup with eight ounces of soda, then add salt to one cup, whatever you wanted them to be able to 
to document. So we're actually going to go ahead and follow this live off of my Chromebook. We're going to go ahead and download this picture right here. And I generated this picture with Chemix.org. Now, if you've never seen Chemix, it's amazing. And um, I'm going to go ahead and skip that tour. You can actually go ahead and get different things and add them to your table in your chemistry room and then have your students be able to document whatever image you create and be able to tell a story of what they've been working on. So I went ahead. I'm going to leave that site and come back to my slide deck here. I created an image for you in Chemex. We're going to go ahead and download it. And then we're going to create a, uh, a keep note for ourselves. So the first thing that we're going to do here, so we're going to go to Google Keep and we're going to take a note. So once we take a note, we're going to go ahead and insert that image that we just downloaded. Um, here's our Chemex image. And we're going to open that up onto our device. And then we can go ahead and give that a title. So chemistry lab and begin taking our notes and adding our details on what we're working on at the end of adding our notes. So add notes here. We can go ahead and change the color and give that note a color. And we're going to talk about why we would be giving notes um, colors in a little while. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we're going to come back here. And it's just as simple as downloading an image or if you are on uh, your phone or a tablet or an iPad, you can do that right um, within the Google Keep Note. Bring that image in. Number two, checklists. All right, so with checklists, and I am a big checklist person, and we're talking about science and math, but think of grocery store, right? <laughs> so we can go ahead and uh, with checklists, what we would do is we would start a note, and I'm going to show you on the next slide. We would start that note, give it a title, and then go ahead to change it to tech checklist. Now, I want you to think about this. When you are sending um, your students information on how to conduct an experiment at home or even steps on working, you know, PEMDAS or something like that, you could share with them a keep note. And it's so simple to be able to do this. So let's go ahead and let's do some live demo here. So we're going to code over to a keep note. We are going to start a new note. So we'll close our Chemex image there. We're going to start a new note. We're going to go to the three dots right here and we're going to say show check boxes. It's as simple as that. So we'll go ahead and we'll say, you know, PEMDAS. I should do it like this, right? And each item, so we'll start with our parentheses, parentheses. I hope I, yeah, I didn't spell that correctly. Oops, where'd my note go? Let's start again. Sorry, PEMDAS. And we're going to add a checklist and parentheses. Do you think I'll spell it right this time? parenthesis and we'll hit enter and then it just goes you know down um, below and adds to our checkbox and we can go ahead and we can color code that so I'm going to go ahead to the color palette I'm going to get purple there and the great thing is is you can go ahead and share add collaborators so you might add your Google Classroom or you might add um you know, your collaborating teacher or maybe just an individual student. So I can go ahead and add whoever I want there. And then they can go ahead as they gather that those items, check them off, and they'll appear at the bottom of the screen as having been complete. If needed, you can always go back and take the checks away and have your list brand new again. All right, so now let's go back. And uh, are you guys ready for number three? I'm just going to scroll over here and check the chat. Yeah, Chemex is awesome. Um, and uh, Google Keep really is so useful. There's just so many reasons to use it. But we're ready to go on to number three. And number three is actually my favorite. 
Option uh, number three is OCR or optical character recognition. And this is pretty cool because we think about students who still like to, um, uh, let me go ahead and make that bigger, who still like to hand, who still like to hand write their notes. And basically they can take their notes like this student did with the plasma membrane and then grab the image text and Google Keep will do OCR and add that image text to the bottom of the page. So let's take a look at what that looks like. Um, we're not gonna do it through handwriting. Uh, we, well, we actually could do it through handwriting if you wanted to. I'm gonna give you a couple of different options to do this. So the first option is you can take a piece of paper near you and jot down some notes. Alternatively, I have an image for you to download and do this. Um, what we'll do is we'll download this image. We're gonna start a keep note, upload the image, and then you're gonna grab the image text. Now check out just how easy this is. I'm gonna go ahead and download that image there. So we'll, we'll get that. There's the image. It's ingredients from something. We're gonna go ahead and click the download button and then I'll close that tab. And then we're gonna go over here to Google Keep. I'm gonna click close and start a new note. But when I start this note, I'm gonna use this new note with image button. So I'm gonna click new note with image. I'm gonna get those ingredients that I had just downloaded and I'm gonna bring them in. Now this could be an image of anything, including something that you've handwritten. Down at the bottom, I'm gonna go back to those three dots and I'm gonna click grab image text. Now the more text there is, the longer it's going to take to grab it. But if you see right here, um, if I scroll up, sorry, if I scroll up, you'll see that it's brought it into my Google note with the image that I grabbed and the text down at the bottom. Then I can go ahead and give it a title. So I'll say ingredients. Always better if you title your notes. And of course I can go ahead and color code there. And we'll come back to the color coding at the end of our time together. All right, let's go back over to our slide deck and let's just review that one more time. So, uh, so that you can come back to this on your own. You're gonna go ahead, you're gonna grab the image that you've downloaded or take a picture of your, um, what you hand wrote, and then you're gonna click those three dots at the bottom right hand corner and you're gonna grab the image text. Oh, yes, yeah, so OCR is, absolutely uh, wonderful. And Tom actually put in the chat, it's really great to add alt text, like especially when we're thinking about Google Sites. Alt text is helpful for Chromevox for the visually impaired um, to add that alt text to any image that you might link to. All right, our next one is illustrations. Um, so with illustrations, you can take any image and the student can actually illustrate it in Google Keep. You can draw right in the Google Keep app or like I've done with this image of the rainforest layers, they can go ahead and bring in that image into Google Keep and write right on it, which is pretty darn cool if you ask me. So we're gonna do this in a minute and let's look at what this looks like. So you've got your image and you've got it downloaded, you upload it into the Google Keep app and then you can write directly on it right there. So let's go ahead and do that now. We're gonna download this illustration of the rainforest. Now my handwriting isn't the best, that's why I think I have focused on technology in my life. I'm gonna go ahead and download this image and in Google Keep, we'll go ahead and close that right here, in Google Keep, I'm gonna go ahead up here and I'm gonna bring the image in, new note with image. I'm gonna click on new note with image. I'm gonna get our diagram and click open. 
Now, you're probably wondering, okay, well, I see the image, I see a place down here where I can write on it. But if you click on that image in Google Keep, in the top right-hand corner, you'll see an edit drawing button. And when I click the edit drawing button, I can go ahead and take my stylus and write right on there, forest floor. I can write anywhere on here. I can go ahead, I can change this. I can do a highlighter if I want and highlight the text. I can get all different types. So I can write in red here. Um, and I can grab my eraser and erase anything, you know, before I submit my assignment. So that's pretty cool if you ask me. And then if I go ahead and click back, I'll see, and it's gonna um, resolve itself in a, in a second here. It's still attached to that same Google Keep note, and you can do, you know, layers of the rainforest and be able to do that. And I'm gonna go ahead and color code this one as well, and I'm gonna click close. So that's pretty neat, and you'll see the thumbnail right there. So let's go ahead and close some of these tabs here and come back to our presentation. Our last one, number five, is voice notes. Now, voice notes is really for your smartphone. And I will come over and I'll, I'll demo on my phone in a second. But I do want to show you, I did take a screen capture. So we all know that we can go into... Um, Google Keep and on our keyboard is a microphone so we can do the voice to text. But voice notes is a little bit different than that. Um, so when I go to voice notes, you'll see on the, um, on the right hand side what I did, and I'll show you how to add the note, is you actually record your note. But there's a difference between it going to just voice to text but it also has the recording listed there as well. So you'll see in that GIF there over on the right that you have an actual recording. So let's play that again. And you'll see that I go ahead and I start typing in, you know, voice wise, my notes about Newton's uh, first law of motion. And then look at the actual keep note, because what you wind up seeing is that 12 second recording there at the bottom. And this is just so great. And I want you to think about all the different students that you work with and the accommodations that you can make for them using Google Keep. There's just so many. So um, I'm going to go ahead to the next slide, and I do want to just point out um, that in order to do voice typing, it won't work on a laptop or a Chromebook, but it will work on your iPad, it will work on your smartphone, anything like that, and of course a, an Android tablet as well. So let's talk about searching and organizing, because we've been taking all of these keep notes, yet, you know, we've got quite a, a, a bit of information um, in the hopper now, and we need to be able to organize it. So as we organize, we're going to use color codes and labels. We can organize by collaborators, voice images and lists keywords, and we can also pin. So let's take a look and at my screen as what that looks like in Google Keep. Um, so first of all, when you search your device, and then I'll switch over to my laptop, but when you search your device um, and you click on it, the very first thing that happens, and I'll go ahead and play it over here on the right so it plays while I'm talking, is it'll come up with, do you wanna search by list or images or anything like that? You also have labels or folders and you can search within those specifically. So I know I have a lot going on on the screen, but if we look over at the, oops, oh, so sorry folks. If we look over at the one on the right, which is the smart device, you'll see it's a little bit different on how it comes up. I I can go ahead and type anything in there. So like if I was looking at the pictures of the eggs, it would be able to find it. On the left, on the laptop view, I can go ahead, I can search. Same options there, it's just a little easier because it's a bigger screen. Um, let's go ahead and do some of that live. So I'm gonna go ahead back to Google Keep and a couple of things that we wanna think about. 
So if I go up to search here, I can actually search by color. So if I scroll down to the bottom, I can pull up all of my, we need a couple of yellow notes. So I can pull up all of my yellow notes. So if you think about if you're a teacher and you teach chemistry, biology, you know, two sections of biology, a section of chemistry, maybe a study hall, and maybe even a section of physics, depending upon the size of your school, you can color code all of your physics notes yellow. And you can have your students do this um, for themselves as well. So that's one thing to do. And then another thing is, is labels. So if I go into this physics note right here, and I go to um, the bottom and I add a label, I can call it, let's say chemistry. But what's really cool, and I'll go ahead and close that. Now, if I go into my label of chemistry, um, it'll pop up <coughs> anything that was labeled chemistry. The other thing that I can do though, is when I take a note, I can use it like a hashtag, I can type, and as soon as I hit the pound sign, here comes my label. So I'll label this one Earth Science and then type my note here and close it. And now you'll see I automatically have Earth Science over on the left and it brings up my Earth Science notes. Or I can search by label Earth Science and it'll bring up my notes. The other thing I can do is I can search by collaborator. So if I go back to my notes here and I type in search, it would list, and this is my colleague Ben Rouse from Absibens, um, but anybody that you've shared notes with, you'd be able to go into search right here and be able to pull up all the notes that you have shared with them. So the next thing we can do is we can search by um, voice recordings. So these are all my notes that have voice recordings. And we can also search by, I'll go back to my notes, we can search by images. So any um, note that has an image in it. So it just makes it so nice and easy to stay organized. And then finally, we did keyword before. We saw eggs here. Um, we can also pin tab. So like here's all of my important notes for today. I wanted to share Chemex and EdTech with Lisa, the YouTube channel, the uh, the link that I've been using, you know, for you all to submit to win a prize at the end of the conference. And then I'm, I even put everybody's Twitter IDs back down there. So, and you'll see the pin here. I'm going to unpin it and go back to my notes and it'll no longer show at the top of my screen or I can go back and find it again, pin it and it'll start back there at the top. I'll be honest, I use this sometimes when I'm grocery shopping and then we have a shared list from everyone in my household. We all add to the list of what we need. I pin it. I'm in the grocery store and I can go ahead and get what's on the list. Um, and then finally... Um, I just wanted to point out that Google has a cheat sheet. And if we take a look at the cheat sheet here, um, you'll see, you know, that it's just a really nice, you know, getting started with keep, some beginner tips, some intermediate and advanced tip, what everything means while you're in Google Keep. Um, and uh, I love what Mr. Archie said in the chat. He said, I'm kind of overwhelmed with information right now. I am too, Archie. Um, but this Google Keep is for keeps. It's so fantastic to keep yourself organized. And then one final bonus one. This is so neat. I put a video uh, linked into the presentation for you as like a Google Keep bonus. This is amazing. You can actually attach a reminder to a Google Keep note. And that video, you can find everything at edtechwithlisa.com, but that video is a location reminder, like with the grocery store, like if you're someday on a field trip with your students and science or math related field trip, give them, share a reminder with them and then add it so that it pops up on their phone when they arrive at the location that you set the reminder for. All right. And then, you know, any questions, you can always email me at lisa at appsevents.com or tweet me at edtechwithlisa. All right, well, I'm going to put my producer hat back on here, and I'm going to go ahead and share 
<clears throat> share, um, let's see. Oops, sorry. Share with you all uh, back to our main presentation. Um, so we are getting started uh, with our last presentation in just a moment. And I see Tara's in the waiting room waiting to be added. Um, so I just wanted to mention that Apps Events is now uh, certified by ISTE in order to do the ISTE, co ISTE coaching program. So sign up for updates from that, and we are offering it in the United States and abroad. Um, you can learn more at aelearninglab.com, AE like Apps Events. Um, and our next presentation is going to be Math Jams. And I'm a big uh, Jamboard user. So we have Tara Linney here with us today. And I'm going to go ahead and add Tara. Oh, wrong computer. I'm going to add Tara to the stream. Hi, Tara. Hello. <laughs> I feel like I just talked a mile a minute, but Google keeps so amazing. And now oh, yeah. I to learn a few new things about Jamboard. Um, and I've been holding my question for you until the very end of our time together. So I'm going to go ahead and switch over to your screen here. And I'm going to mute myself. Thanks for joining us, Tara. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right, so if you're new to using Jamboard, we're going to start from the very beginning and then we're gonna speed through a whole bunch of examples now, but we'll go at a good pace. Um, so first, Jamboard is more than just the board that lives in your classroom. So with remote and hybrid learning and everything, you can actually access it from your app launcher. So when you're in Chrome, it's typically on the second scroll down and you'll see this little icon here that looks like a musical note um, and that is Jamboard. All right, so with Jamboard, you get a screen that looks kind of like this, okay? Um, to make a new Jamboard, you're going to click on the orange circle in the bottom right-hand corner. When you make a new Jamboard, it'll take you to this blank space here. To expand the frame and see all of the different frames that you have and even to add more, you just click on this button here. I've got a pre-made Jamboard for you, so I'm gonna walk you through how I made those things. Um, but I just wanted to show you that if you were going to make one from scratch, that would be how you go and do that. You can also organize your Jamboards. So I like to view them in, um, in row fashion instead of grid fashion because it lets me know what content is actually on the board. Um, so that's one of the nice updates with Jamboard. All right, so we're gonna jump right in. All right, so with Jamboard, you can do a lot of really great things with math instruction. Um, and this is something that's great no matter if your students are right in front of you or if they're online. You can you can push this out even on Google Classroom, which is great, but I'm gonna go over the mechanics of how to make the Jamboards. So this right here is an image, and I had downloaded this onto my computer and then was able to upload it onto the screen here. Over here, I'm using this feature of a sticky note. Now by default, when you have a sticky note and you say something like, good day class, by default, it's going to be yellow, but if you wanted to make it transparent, like the example that I have here, you would just click on this um, teardrop with the line through it, and then that would make it transparent. And then when I click Save, it appears. Now with the sticky notes, I can move them around. I can make them larger or smaller, okay? And depending upon how much text I'm using, will um, that will dictate how large my text is. One of the nice features with Jamboard that has been an update in the last year is that you can now use text boxes. So for these numbers down here, these are all, whoops, let's delete that. These are all just text boxes. And rather than saying text box, text box, text box, say that 10 times fast, um, I made the first number and then I used the three circles here, did the duplicate tool, and then just replace the text that was in there to make the second and so on and so forth. And what that does is that ensures that my sizes are all the same size. And I checked and all of these will are the size that will fit into 
the number boxes up here. So how this particular activity works is I have this image here and I did the three circles, order and send to back. When I send this image to the back, students can then use these numbers and drag them on top so that they don't get lost behind the image that was placed first. All right, so in, in this particular activity, students have to use the numbers below to create the largest number that they can as close, well, not the largest, as close to 1000 as they can and include it in the sum. So what you'll have students do is say, hmm, if I have one number that starts with eight, one that starts with one, hmm, I can't have one that starts with two because right there, eight plus two is 10. I add two zeros to the end, that's automatically a thousand, so that would put me over. So using this process, it allows students to think in advance in terms of mathematically what makes sense in terms of place value and the number of which the order, the order in which the numbers appear. All right, so we're going to reset this activity. Another thing that you could do, which I could have just done, is hit the undo button, and the undo will undo the last action that you did. So this is just a nice, a nice way to move from a worksheet to a nice interactive um, drag and drop activity that gets students to think about number sense. The next activity is similar, but instead this is all about difference and there's less numbers. There are fewer numbers that the students are working with. So the objective here is to use the numbers one through six and only at the most one, using the numbers once each to create the smallest possible difference. So here, number sense wise, students would think in the same way and they would say, all right, if I use the six here and I use the one here, oh wait, six minus one is five. But if instead I put the five here, then that already starts off as a 100 number or less. Well, it'll be less because the eight, like this number is going to be more than 600 and this one's gonna be more than 500. So it gets them thinking about number sense in terms of difference. All right. The next example that we're going to look at is really fun. So part of the great thing about math is that you can use real world objects to replicate a mathematical concept. So rather than area and perimeter being this Greek thing of, I have no idea how to measure like a, a table or a desk or a rectangle, like, do I need a ruler? You don't really need a ruler. Um, what you could do instead is use Jamboard to create a problem for students where they have to find the area and the perimeter. Right here, I've used a grid as my background. And how I set this up was I went into background here and there's a grid option. You could alternative, alternatively use rules, and that would be like ruler paper. Um, you could also use dots, and that would be like dots. I just use the grid because I like the way that it looks with this example. Over here, I use the, post, the sticky note um, for the question, for the main question. And what I could have also done is given students directions on how to duplicate the cracker. So over here to duplicate an object, well, let me go back one step. I then made the triangle and to make the triangle shape, you click on this little teeny tiny triangle to the right of the circle shape on the left hand side of your menu. And then you've got a square. So you could do a square, you could do a bar, you could do any of these shapes and have them be a part of your Jamboard. I did a square. So when I click on square, I'll notice that with crosshairs, you can start to click, hold and drag and drag that out. 
And you can see right away, the reason as to why I use the grid is because I can get pretty exact on the spaces. I can also click on the three circles and send this to the back. What I would do here then is grab the, and I'll duplicate this so that I don't mess up the one that I'm working with. I could then grab the cracker here and then resize it so that it becomes the sample that students work with, okay? So that's the basic setup there. Now, three circles, delete. Now what students will end up doing is clicking on the three circles, duplicating, and doing this as many times as they need to make enough crackers to fill the area of the rectangle. In addition to filling the area of the rectangle, students are also challenged to figure out the perimeter. With this particular activity, so they wanna make sure that they have enough, and if they go over, that's fine. Um, luckily, and, and in a nice way on Jamboard, um, everything is in the same logical place. So in terms of order, everything is gonna be on the three circles. And in terms of if you want to delete something or make more of something, it's all going to be there as well. Okay, so then the student would move the salting crackers around, and then they technically don't even have to complete the whole figure if they know that length, time, length times width is equal to perimeter. Um, what's, I'm sorry, length times width is equal to area. What's also nice with this is that when they do complete the figure, they can also see what the perimeter is by counting the number of crackers around. So this is a really great way to use kind of a, the digital version of real world objects to get students to understand complex concepts like area and like perimeter. All right, another example with Jamboard is figuring out the sum of the lines on a triangle, right? So in this particular activity um, and how I got this was I used my image option here. So on the mountain, I can add an image and I can do an, a Google image search. I can also pull things from Google Drive or grab things that live in my photos. So if I want to say something like math triangle sums, then at first, you know, it gives you your typical triangles with the angles, and maybe that's what you're looking for. And then if you scroll down a little bit, I'm trying to remember, was that the keyword that I use? Let's try this one more time. Triangle sums. There we go. So when I search for triangle sums, I get this magic triangles activity and it's blank, which is excellent. I can then insert that in. I can move it around. I can click on the three circles, order it, send it to the back. And in this activity, I can have the students move the numbers into the different triangles to make to create the same sum on each side of the triangle. So this is a really great power up activity. This is probably one of my favorite activities in terms of introducing students to probability using dice. Um, so what happens is you can have a question here where you're asking students the probability of the six-sided dice um, roll to equal to 10 or to equal to another number. And let's say that you wanted to ask a lot of different questions around probability using this exact image, but maybe changing the question here. What you would do is, Click on the drop down up here. So up here it says five out of ten, and you're on you're on frame five of the boards. When you click on that drop down, you'll see these three circles here, and you can actually click on the three circles and duplicate. So instead of recreating the wheel every single time, 
you now know that you are on six, so the duplicated one. And I can change this question from what is the probability that the sum of the of one dice roll would be 10 to what is the proper probability that it would equal less than 10, right? So then that totally changes the question. It totally changes what students are looking for because now instead of looking for an exact number, they have to look at the probability of the roll being equal to nine, eight, seven, and well, that's about it because you can't go below six on a roll of two dice. All right, so that's one really cool thing that will actually shorten the amount of time that you spend in making activities if you're just varying the question with the same visual example. And this image is actually one image that I duplicated. And when I duplicated it, I just shifted it. So it's a really great way to use the same image but switch up the angle from which the image is being seen. Another great thing, and this is really great for, for students understanding what prime numbers are and what they aren't, and for you to be able to see what they think of as a prime number or not. This image, I didn't have to download it. This was actually available in the Google image search, and I just typed in hundreds chart. When I typed in hundreds chart, I got all of these different hundreds charts. And I could have grabbed one of the decorated ones that said hundreds chart, or I could have just done what I did, which was grab a basic one that just showed the numbers. When I inserted that here, I lined it up pretty perfectly to the background. And then when I made this, this, um, oh, when I made this sticky note here, I said, prime click save and every time that you every time that you make a note it's going to assume that you want to make another note and if you don't you can just click cancel and it'll get you out so by default this is the size of the note i then grabbed the corners here readjusted it to fit within the box and then students can be empowered to click on three circles duplicate and move this around to every prime number that exists on the hundreds chart. So imagine using this as a way to gauge whether students understand the difference between prime numbers. Let me reset that one. Yep, too far. Okay. The next example that we're going to look at is finding the surface area of a cube. So if you're working with middle school and high school students who are um, who are working with the surface area of objects, this is a really great activity. Again, Google image search here, but you're empowering them to look closer at the image and to do the math. Students can use any of the tools on the left hand side here. So your teacher tools are the same exact tools that students get. They can choose if they wanna use a text box to write their work in, or they can use any of the different utensils here. Uh, by default, you have a pen. You can also use a marker, a highlighter, or a brush. If students are working on a computer, sometimes it's easier to use a text box, whereas if they're working on an iPad or some tablet device, um, then it's easier maybe for them to use a stylus with these different tools. So then the students can do the work here. Obviously, I'm on a computer because my drawing is not super great. And then they could work their work out there or they could put it in the text box here. Students can also customize when they're in the text box, they can customize what their text looks like. So it can be a display, which is really large, um, or it could be down here in normal text, and they can change the color as well and the alignment. Get to the next to last example here. All right, another example here is ordering numbers from 
greatest from least to greatest. And how this was made is the same exact way as one of the other activities with the prime numbers. You just grab a sticky note and then you just start typing numbers. So I said 0.19138, um, save. And then the nice thing about the sticky note is that it keeps prompting you. So you just keep typing different numbers in, right? And then the activity could be that students move the numbers from least to greatest or from greatest to least. And by default, the, the sticky notes come out and they space pretty nicely on the board. And so you don't like you can either move them around um, like I did here just by clicking, holding and dragging and moving them um, or just leave them where they lay and have the directions somewhere else on the screen. Another example here, and if you're a Battleship fan or if you teach anything about the coordinate planes, um, the backdrop, the background that I used here was the graph background. You can have students plot points in a coordinate. You could have the entire coordinate plane. You can make this as big or as small as you want to. And what I actually used when I made this was I used the zoom function here. And what Zoom does is it allows me to, when I use the text box to create my numbers, I can get them pretty much right exactly on the line. So I can make sure that my alignment is correct. So that helps me as the designer of the lesson to really make sure that I'm accurate. All right. Let me go back to fit. See, by default, it's at 46%. So if you really want to get to 100, it's like so much clearer. There we go. And then when students do this activity, they can use the pen and they can create a circle. Um, they can also use their circle tool here and then make a smaller little dot and move that onto the particular point. The last example here is all about money. So when students are learning about the value of money, and again, all of these are Google image search. What I did here was I clicked on the image search and I said quarter and voila, picture of a quarter, transparent background, and I added that onto my, onto my board for students to then figure out this problem. So then students um, in the example here would use the coins to show $2.68 in the least amount of coins. And right here, I'm giving them the direction also to duplicate the coins as many times as needed. So then students would go into the three circles and say, hmm, a quarter is worth the most. If I make eight of those, nine, ten, oh, 10 of those, then I would only have to make 18 cents more. So here are just some really cool things that you can do with Jamboards when it comes to math instruction. Tara, that was awesome. Like <laughs> I, I put in the chat, like I just don't even think to put images in Jamboard. Like I really just think of it as like the post-it notes, like a Padlet or a Nearpod Collaborate, right? Mm-hmm. This is amazing. So actually one of the questions from the chat from Efren was, can you do subscript and superscript in the text boxes? So the, um, when I go to the text box and I go here, there's no sub or superscript yet. Um, and the reason why I say yet is because everything with Google is yet. Just because it doesn't exist now doesn't mean that it won't. And if you want something to exist, just send feedback to Google. To Google. This appears, um, the feedback option is on every single Google tool. Say that 10 times fast. Um, and what it'll do is once there's enough requests for something, after a while, Google might just include that feature in it. It's so true. I mean, that's really, I think, I'm convinced that's how Classroom has gotten to where it is now, right? Oh, okay. yeah. So here's my question that I've been waiting to ask you. Um, so with Whiteboard being an option in Google Meet now, I see more and more teachers utilizing this. And I still haven't gotten a clear answer on how many students can collaborate synchronously in a jam. 
So can versus should, I think, is the question. Um, <laughs> let's see. The most that I've ever had on one Jamboard at one time was about 50 users. Um, I would have to double check. I, I almost want to say it's 100, but I would not press that just because then it becomes which board are they on? Are they creating new boards? Um, yeah, the management issue becomes a, a bigger issue. <laughs> well, it used to be at some point that you could only have 16 people working simultaneously in a jam. Um, so I guess I know that they can view it, but to actually being able to edit it. And I think that I think that it's increased. I just can't find documentation. Um, Nicole put in the chat, I wonder if the quiz show could be used and then insert those equation images. Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> Copy paste. Yep, <laughs> and then Efren saying you might need to create a Google drawing to download the image to insert it. I don't know. There were just you just had some really, really amazing math examples here for sure. <clears throat> um and I have a copy to the link. I just don't know if like we can share it. Like, so if you want to create your own, um, I can share that. Oh, do you want to put it in the private chat and I'll drop it? Or you can drop it in the YouTube, whichever is easier for you. Sure. Um, I'll give it to you in the private chat and then you can throw it in. Yeah. Awesome. Um, cool. Yep. Yeah, I've got my show really quickly how to make a copy. Yes, please. Cool. So when you open this, you're only going to have view access to make a copy. You just do the three circles, make make a copy, and you can have your very own copy of this entire Jamboard that I've already reset. Um, and yeah, add, edit, change, go for it. I appreciate you sharing that link. Um, and, and it's already in the chat. And we're good to go. Um, Tara, if you want to stick with me for a couple of minutes, you're welcome to. I'm just going to thank everybody who attended live today. Um, I have collected uh, a lot of names and email addresses. I'm going to give the link again in a moment for um, the giveaways. But I wanted to thank our premier sponsor, um, Acer. Uh, Check out the Acer website. Um, the EMEA address is there, but go to acer.com, go to, go to acerforeducation.com and check out all of their amazing products. And thank you, Acer, for being such a great sponsor. If you didn't do it yet, go to gsummit.link at uh, slash Acer. And I'm gonna go ahead and drop that in the chat one more time. Um, I'm not gonna pull live winners because a lot of people that filled out the form watched maybe the first two hours of our virtual summit that haven't been with us the whole time and that's okay. Um, but go ahead and fill out that gsummit.link slash Acer. We're giving away one copy of each of Jesse Levinsky's two books. We're giving away 10 um, one year codes for explain everything. Thank you, Rashawn Richards. And of course, we're giving away a free ticket to, um, if it was an in-person summit, it would be a different story, but, um, we're giving away one ticket to one of apps events uh, boot camps. We have new level one and level two boot camps, um, launching in January. Uh, so stay tuned for more information for that. And don't forget that um, Apps Events also works as AE Learning Lab and we're partnered with ISTE to provide in the United States and abroad uh, the ISTE certification boot camps. Thank you so much for joining us today. This will be archived on the YouTube channel that you are watching right now. And um, if you submitted to win a prize, uh, you should get something in your email from me uh, by Monday morning. So have a great rest of your day or a great morning or a great evening, depending upon where you are tuning in from. Thank you again, Tara. Thank you to the rest of our presenters. And um, everybody, enjoy the rest of your day.